edition of uh, episode number 74 uh sacred must much uh excuse me sacred hey. mushroom rituals uh the search for the blood of quetzalcoatl uh with our guest tom lane um and uh, you can check out tom's book it's below in the uh, link underneath the video um check us out on patreon uh patreon.com slash mike and maurice we actually have an uh another conversation on there um for just two dollars a month you get access to our exclusive content uh we have a conversation about 5meo dmt with tom on there uh uploaded right now the so you, can check, stuff. you can check that out but uh we're actually going to do an episode on the uh, mythology and the codices from uh, the aztecs and uh, mesoamericans what's going on tom how are you i'm real great and uh i really want to make a comment about somebody should support you on patreon especially the topic on the 5-MEO DMT and the aspect of, uh, you know, these peyote, ayahuasca, sacred mushrooms, San Pedro, I have ancient rituals and ceremonial traditions where some of this new stuff that's only around, hey, you need to be fully aware of what's happening and take responsibility. And the thing I tell people, you know, it's like the American Indians, don't pay to pray. Well, if you advertise or take money, then you're going to be responsible. That's why I always like to be in special groups where every single person knows somebody in the group, you know, and uh, takes full responsibility for what they're doing. No, absolutely. So so they should go on Patreon because that's a valuable conversation. Well, we appreciate that, and we appreciate your your take on it. I know it's a popular uh, subject right now, so it's good that people educate themselves on it and understand exactly what's going on because, I mean, I can tell you from, you know, when we were younger and we're just taking psychedelics, we did do research, but uh, that was the dark ages of psychedelics, really, when, you know, you could get them, but there wasn't a lot of stuff. Maybe Irwids was the only thing really around to to get knowledge about that kind of stuff, but... uh, all right, I'm going to pull up the uh, the slide here. and uh, Down to brass tacks. Excuse me. That's the last one. Yeah, I know. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a nice capper. I love that picture. Let me pull it back to the... Whoa, uh, whoa, yeah, Kerry Thompson does that, and he does incredible stuff. He makes a lot of uh, artwork and stuff and sculptures for buildings even and, and for Burning Man. Okay. Sweet. All right, let's pull that up here. All right. Yep, cover me right up. Thank you. I'm trying not to, but that's that, <laughs> no, it's fine. That's the best we're going to get, Maurice. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think you want to make that as big as possible for the oh, people. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They don't care what you or I look like. Yeah, Maurice, jeez. <laughs> they don't care what you look like at all. <laughs> nope. All right, so uh, all right, we got that up here. We are ready to roll. Well, this is just um, a picture of Quetzalcoatl and one of his avatars, one of his many, with the god of death, and they're sharing the same spine. And on the left and right, you see the 20 days of the month. The the Aztecs had 13 20-day months and five extra days, and they had 260 days of celebration. And they also followed, as omens, Venus and the moon and earth and where they were venus has a 854 day rotation around the sun of course you know earth has 365 and there's rotations of the moon but the main thing you need to understand about the philosophy is that you can't impose any european or asian philosophy on it uh you can't take any pagan european or the druids the vikings you can't take the greeks the romans the egyptians you can't take Eastern Christianity. You can't take modern philosophy. You can't take modern uh, concepts of gods. You can't take the Tibetan, the Asian. There's nothing in there that relates to the metaphysics of the Tuk. And until you understand that, you don't understand anything really about how the Mesoamericans thought. And the biggest thing about this, they consider that the Tuk was from the beginning. It was a creation of the beginning, and it goes on until forever till it ends. And all energy, everything flows out of that. And there's four types of motion energy, and they would give these gods and goddesses 
and even avatars of gods are brothers of gods are opposite, you know, good and bad of the same God for this energy force. They did not believe in good and evil. They only believed in life and balance. And the most interesting aspect about all of this was that male, female, life, death, all they considered the same as energy coming and going. A lot of their beautiful uh, statues will have a half a face of death and half a face of life. And this is showing Quetzalcoatl and his buccal wind god, 11 wind, with the god of death sharing the same spine. And uh, James Maffey has some a book called Aztec Philosophy, and also on YouTube, James Maffey, M-A-F-F-I-E, and you can try to start to understand what the took is and what this philosophy about the four energies in motion, and it also has to do with astral traveling and also uh, divination. But this, this is all about movement and motion and things in motion. They did not consider anything as stable. You know, like Plato said, it had to be something formed and fixed. Exact opposite of the uh, of this uh, Noir philosophy of Mesoamerica, where everything was just energy and motion. There was no life after death. There are three aspects of the of your life force: your liver, your lung, and your hearts. And they went to different parts, and one of them was reformed into energy again. But the ego was never going to return, and they considered the earth a really slippery place. And the thing of humans was to get in balance, and they considered there were only two important days in your life, the day you were born and the day you figured out why. And this sacred ceremony was for the day you figured out why. And so I think we could go to the next slide now. Yeah, and actually you make a good point about Plato, but I, I'll point out that uh, Parmenides, anybody that's familiar with Parmenides' um, uh, philosophy, this actually seems to be more consistent with that because Parmenides believed that there is only this one thing and it's non-duality um, and um, the, the it's always in constant change, you know? So uh, we were talking about monism last time and you were explaining that... Uh, you know, this is their version of monism, the uh, the uh, Aztecs. Well, they considered it all the same, coming and going, life and death, uh, you know. Uh, and so, but, but the aspect of this, usually the thing people should realize is almost every culture had a fault. To, uh, a metaphysics, but mm -hmm. often there was an aspect of the gods or gods that the average guy on the street believed in, but the sages, the uh, philosopher kings, the uh, uh, elites knew the cosmic aspect of this. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like a little kid has to have Santa Claus or the idea that there's some god up there in a white robe on a cloud, mm. right? Zeus, right? Don't shatter my mom's dreams, my friend. <laughs> hey, I'll, Santa Claus was my favorite, but you know, the, 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 <laughs> but then there's an astral, spiritual, cosmic aspect of that. And so that's different. But uh, the biggest thing about the philosophy of Western philosophy and religion is they knew that there weren't any gods as a God, quote, like a Zeus up there, or they didn't think in Christ or God in heaven. They just said, considered everything was coming out of this one energy force. Mm -hmm. And that they didn't have a whole lot of a relationship to it other than to try to figure it out. That's why they looked as these days with Venus, the moon, and uh, the earth more as omens of how to act. Now, the first of the primitive people, if you study archaeologists, there weren't any gods. Everybody originated when there weren't any gods, and people had like wizards or witches who would try to act like the rain to cause it to rain. Or more often, since they were hunter-gatherers, they weren't. They didn't have farming because farming created the civilizations uh, to act like the deer and find where the deer were, that sort of thing. And then later. And see, the Toltecs only had this sort of thing. And then Quetzalcoatl, after he took the sacred mushroom, said there's a deity and a spark in the heart of man. And this spark that exists in man 
is the relationship between the earth above and the sun below. Now, Quetzalcoatl was a male female serpent. It was the front part was the female with the ascending bird, the Quetzal, and the male serpent. Mm. And from the blood of the uh, male serpent, female serpent, male, female, it's uh, all in one. It's just like they consider male and female sort of the same thing. They recognized they were different, but they and they were antagonistic, but you had to have them in balance. That was the whole thing about getting in balance. Well, from the penis of the serpent where the blood fell, the sacred mushrooms grew. And if you look at historically, all of a sudden there's been some big leap or something happened. Well, Quetzalcoatl was a man, a king. His father had been a king, and he was a man, king of the Toltecs, and he built this incredible civilization, jewelry, artwork, all this stuff after he'd taken the sacred mushroom. And the main thing he did, he stopped warfare between tribes, and he also stopped human sacrifice. And all this wonderful art, all this incredible uh, building of buildings, huge pyramids, all this stuff and all his knowledge of the sacred mushroom he was giving away and the Toltecs were really upset. Why are you doing this? We're the chosen people. And basically, Quetzalcoatl said there are no chosen people. All life is love and pain and all movement is created by love and pain and we all have that and everything is for all of mankind. And there was a basic belief that love and pain were opposites of the same thing but there was also the con one other concept of what the took or what it gave to mankind, which wasn't necessarily valued, was knowledge. Because knowledge can make a lot of people pompous or think they know better, you know, than somewhere else. That's why I always love Plato's idea you mentioned of the philosopher kings, where whoever rules you has a place to live, has basic food, has basic clothes, but can't have any expensive jewelry, can't own land, can't own work. All the things are taken uh, away from them that's the ownership of something but you're provided from everything to l live if you want to be a leader king yeah that's actually I but, think I think in the Republic he talks about the only person he knew to be uh, worthy of that would be like Socrates because Socrates was aware of what he didn't know and that was like the highest um, you know compliment of somebody that's on the search of knowledge and, and um, enlightenment that kind of stuff so Right, and that's sort of almost in a way like the concept of you have to find a balance in life. That's what makes modern society so ridiculous. They want to have rules for everything and put everything, and everything is not like a square peg, and you know that you some round pegs are shoving into square holes. And you know, the, the idea of that the philosopher king couldn't be corrupted if he didn't own anything. Right. So what do we have here with this? Uh, so this, this is the uh, deified heart, which was a sacred ceremony that Quetzalcoatl taught to his followers. This was a sacred ceremony that was done by the Pocatecas, or the priest and priest of Tlaloc, or uh, the Jaguar Eagle Knights. Now, Quetzalcoatl was one of the few gods, and he had many avatars, that was both in ritual form, having both priest and priestess of equal value. And they held these sacred ceremonies of the deified heart and kept this wisdom. And they were all people that had done the deified heart. And also people like the Pocatecas did it. They're a special breed of traveling merchants that travel all over Mesoamerica. And I, we've talked about this before, about how all this spread. They went all over the place, and they spread the sacred ceremony of the deified heart, but they're also expected to do fair trade and treat everybody right. And when they got back to Tiwakon, of course, they were bringing back all sorts of stuff for the empire. They're bringing back jade, feathers. They really valued lots of feathers for their regalia and stuff. But they were supposed to live a humble life and not show anything in their home. And, in fact, the leader of the Pocatecas would come along so long every so often and say, okay, now we're going to give everything in your home away. You know, so uh, these were traveling merchants, and then there were the Jaguar Eagle Knights, and the Jaguar and Eagle Knights were a special type of, like, kung fu warrior knight. 
they would be like, say, Buddhist priests that were trained very much more severely as far as fasting, cold, and heat than the Navy SEALs ever considered. In fact, they were actually injured sometime and expected to fight. Now, all of these had taken in the sacred ceremony of the Deified Heart, which is a ceremony Quetzalcoatl the man discovered and gave to his followers. And after he died later, this ceremony became known as the Quet ceremony to meet Quetzalcoatl because in this sacred ceremony, a jeweled diamond faceted serpent comes made of millions of diamonds that's about the same size as a human and this is not a mythology this i mean it's all over mythology but people do this today and they all see the same thing don't by any means think i'm the only person that sees quetzalcoatl or has this experience with quetzalcoatl and uh, often it's a time this particular ceremony is an intent to bind yourself to quetzalcoatl and it's an intent to both meet and for a short time become Quetzalcoatl. And we'll talk about this later. But many people have met Quetzalcoatl outside of this ceremony if they take sacred mushrooms. And I was just up in Georgia and one woman was telling me, yeah, in one of her first ceremonies, she met Quetzalcoatl and he basically met her at her door and said, you're not supposed to go any further now. You're supposed to wait. Well, mm. these particular people had done lots of ceremonies over time, and they were dedicated to coming that, and basically they were willing to set themselves from a spiritual sense inside on fire to meet and become Quetzalcoatl and try to copy his life of piety, self-sacrifice, love, and empathy, and kindness. Now, isn't there a connection between the Incan god and the the pre-Incan god uh, Contiki Viracocha or Viracocha in Quetzalcoatl. I know, I've because Viracocha was known as the feather plume serpent, and also I know um, Quetzalcoatl is. But the I think Viracocha translates into foam of the sea. But I was just curious. Do you know of any if that's the connection between the two or? Well, here's what I do know. Supposedly. Quetzalcoatl left Tiwatiwakan and went to Chichen Itza, and the Mayans called him Culiacan. You know, the Toltec civilization was about 900 or 1,000, 1,100 years, well before the Triple Alliance, or what was later called the Aztecs. Hmm. But he uh, helped them create the Great Pyramids, and they called him Culiacan. Now, I do know the Pocatecas went all over Central and South America, but I don't know much other than the philosophy down there. Now, I have a friend in Bogota. You could maybe have him on sometime. He's one, uh, I think, Epimea, and he sends me a lot of information, and they've found out tremendous amounts of stuff in Peru and Colombia and other places that the Indians use mushrooms. But uh, yeah, it's basically been way. the Peruvian and Colombian people and they're mycology clubs that are finding all this. And uh, he's written a lot of books and stuff that he sent to me. And I think everything is truthful, but he knows a lot more about that than I do. Yeah, I mean, the uh, the only thing I was just going to mention is like Vera Coach, because uh, you were talking about what Quetzalcoatl was teaching the uh, the indigenous people. The, in the mythology uh, of Viracocha, same thing. He kind of just showed up as the savior and taught the people uh, agriculture, animal husbandry. At the time, people were doing human sacrifices, and he told them that was wrong. And instead of doing that, they said should sacrifice flowers. Um, so it seems exactly, like, it, exactly. So it seems like there's a parallel there for sure. Yeah, and you know, if you look at this. Uh, Usually, somehow it was a person that was a king god. And sometimes how they ate that uh, uh, mushroom or an ethogen, and they had this connection between the body, the conscious, and the unconscious, and they made this spiritual, intellectual leak, everything. And then they taught it to other people. Well, usually they were an astonishing person to have done this, to be the first uh bring this to their people but then after they pass or go away the people in essence make a god of them or the event 
that he's mm-hmm. taught them to do, they name after that person. No, that makes sense. And that's that's not just Mesoamerica. That's in a lot of places all over the world. I'm sure a lot of people that have studied religions all over the world and gods and this know a lot about it. There's even a word for it when a person transitions into a god. So do you think, though, b- before we get on with the slideshow, I just wanted to ask you a question really quick. I mean, are you familiar with the work of, like, Thor Heyerdahl um, and, like, you know, the Kontiki and all that stuff, how he... Oh, yeah, he's a hero of mine because... I've always uh, thought it baloney that people from ancient craft couldn't go from Asia to the uh, South America or to Central America or wherever. And, you know, it's obvious the Vikings made it to the Midwest. And, right. you know, they've had stuff from Central America, uh, Middle or Mexico all the way up there. But, yeah, I mean the idea I that uh, considered it absurd. But the idea, and we've talked about this before, the land bridge. That the only people made it over were this from this land bridge, right? The Bering uh, Strait, uh-huh. and there. that's absurd. And one of the most interesting things is like DNA, and they recently discovered in Peru, in a high mountains of all these uh, mummies they had of people from the Caucasians. You know where the Caucasians are in Russia? They're in around the Volga, where the Battle of Stalingrad was fought, way off the Volga River. That's way in the middle of Russia. Before you, It's right before the Urals. Right. And uh, they found those people's DNA. So, and, and now it's exciting finding DNA from uh, all sorts of things that they're finding. Uh, you know, people, uh, what they thought, either correct or incorrect. Yeah, the um, we actually talked about that on we did an episode, a couple episodes on Easter Island, and I was doing a bunch of research, and they did find so the DNA of the Easter Island people is um, mostly I think it's like seventy five percent Polynesian, Melanesian, all that, and then um, I think like ten percent. Um, uh, what what was the other ten percent? I forget. But then there was there was a small like five percent of European ancestry um, that they connected to more ancient times. So it wasn't like it was recent integration of the Europeans when the Spaniards came over. It was a lot, it was a long time before that is what they found. So um, the theory is, is that I'm, I'm the whole basis of me bringing it up is just to point out that there was probably a lot more seafaring uh, travel going on, you know, with these rafts and ships that people were building and stuff. Uh, than previously talked about. You know, the Egyptians built boats, the uh, Greeks were seafaring people, the Phoenicians were amazing travelers, um, and then you've got, you know, these South American people, which Thor Heyerdahl proved that you could build this raft out of uh, indigenous materials found along the shore in uh, Peru and Chile and, and sail all the way across the ocean. So, Well, he, no, he was coming from Asia. Yeah, well, I mean, the one, the Contiki was... And here's what he proved, with materials back then, you could do it. So I'm sure if there was some knucklehead like me that got lost in the rocks direction and got in a typhoon, no telling I'd ended up in South America rather than in, uh, you know, Vietnam. Right. Well, that makes sense. Um, So back to the slide here. So did you, did an artist uh, draw this? this, um... Yeah, this young woman... uh, who's a very visionary sort of woman. She's, uh, you know, uh, she drew this and I saw it. And I said, can I use it and give you credit? She said, you can have it. And I said, I don't want to have it. I just want to be able to use it because I'd express it to me. It expresses the uh, aspect of the deified heart, sort of similar to the heart of Christ, you know, the heart on fire. Mm hmm. Yeah, and the aspect badass. the body's like intelligent thing. and the body can direct the mind and the subconscious what to do. And it's also the greatest healing power because in this sacred ceremony, the DN5 heart, if you pull enough oxygen in and you're in the state of mind to keep me gets quite, it'll do amazing healing. Uh, as I mentioned in the desert about three months ago in Utah, we did this ceremony and Quetzalcoatl came in a, uh, literally swallowed a guy that had been in a motorcycle wreck and he came out totally healed. And, uh, I know I, my knee had been blown out on the Appalachian trail and it came out healed. But the aspect of this is 
not just that for the great healing power, divination and clairvoyance, but this is a ceremony for rebirth. It's an actual ceremony of rebirth. Hmm. Interesting. No, it's go to the next slide now. Yeah, that's an awesome picture for sure. Now, this is uh, what was for a long time called the Vienna or Mystic Mushroom Codex. It's the natives now call it the Utah Tahona Codex. And the original, what you're looking at here, has gone through about 20 hands before in 1667, uh, Leopold of uh, Habsburg gave it to the National Library in Austria, where it still is. Mm. This is, uh, they know it's from the 16th century. They know it's pre-Columbian. And uh, it's made of deer hide with layers of stucco. Now, you don't see that. You'll see a better one of that, but have 52 folding sheets, about eight and three quarters by 10 inches long on the sides. And this particular page is called the Mixed Tech Mushroom Codex because it reveals a sacred ceremony of the deified heart. And this is a ceremony that that basically uh, Quetzalcoatl taught to the uh, Toltecs. And this was the ceremony to meet and become the jewel-winged serpent. And it was also the ceremony of death and rebirth. Mm. And uh, this was exhibited as a sort of an exemplar for the priest and priestess to use and also, so a lot of nobles went through this uh, process, too. Now, if we look at this, you read it from bottom right up, across and down. Uh, in other words, the center here is uh, the red line divides the page, and you read from the right side up, across, and then down. So let's let's go to the next page. Okay. Now, this is uh, in the British Museum, and uh, it's what's supposed to be an original, would have looked like in the 1500s. In other words, you would have seen all these colors, and it would have been stuccoed over on the deer hide to preserve it, and it would fold out and everything. Well, this is, they found it somewhere near the city of Oaxaca, in the state of Oaxaca, but this was... Uh, or that's where it was made. This was one of two books they found in Montezuma's palace. Mm. This book, uh, the uh, Vienna Codex, and this is page 54, and there's also another book called the Zoche Notal, which is a book of all the plants, all how they could be used for textiles, dyes. Uh, you realize they didn't have uh, digital stuff or YouTube or videos back then. There wasn't even the printing press. Uh, part of this ritual that you see going into the underworld in this water, Quetzalcoatl's also going in to re retrieve this knowledge, this sacred knowledge about these certain plants and how they were used, everything from weaving mats to food to dyes. Hmm. And uh, like I said, it starts on the uh, right there at the bottom. And this is as Quetzalcoatl's ascension into the world and ascension as the sun. Now, if we look on the uh, right side going up, I'm just going to go through this briefly, and then we'll go through each section of it. Okay. We see the symbol for, if we look on the right at the very bottom, the Utu River, and three reeds that are being held in a hand, which means this life isn't in balance, and we have near this river two sages that are sort of spirits of the river. They're sitting below facing each other, and they represent the spirits of the river itself with the symbol there on the uh, extreme left of them on the right side is the symbol of eternity. That's the symbol of eternity. And now what we're going to do is look at above them, there's an ancient... Aztec priest, a lot of people think, or he's a curandero, and he's on a mat, and he's getting ready for a ceremony, and he's talking to the buccal image of Quetzalcoatl, and you start to see behind him 
the sacred motifs that start to come at the beginning of the ceremony. Yeah. Now, this is uh, an aspect of the beginning of this ceremony when they're discussing their intent and what they're going to do, because it's very, very important to have intent, you know, in the ceremony you're going to do. And now, the above them, you see Quetzalcoatl in his regalia with a leaven lizard representing the sacred mushroom on his back. But if you look to uh, that symbol of that A there with uh, none of the beads and the little dot to the right, that's a symbol of the beginning of time. Right. And on the very right, you see four lizard who represents the sacred mushroom and, and he has that little uh, thing with him that's a little lizard in front with four dots on it. That's how you know he's four lizard. Right. Well, Quetzalcoatl is going to take initiative to the Valley of Death, to the valley of where Quetzalcoatl is, who you see a symbol in the green on the far left, but on his back now is four lizard, but he's then changed into a leaven lizard because so- he's starting to go on the back of the avatar. So what's the explanation? Quetzalcoatl, who's often called four wind. What's the explanation for toward this valley? And this is an important aspect of now he has the regalia on it. And these are live living mushrooms that are going to be used in the sacred ceremony. So is that how we how, go above is, that and we is, see Sochapilli, the god of ethogens <laughs> and the sun prince with tears on his eyes and Quetzalcoatl scraping the uh, head of death. And the black bee, and then above that we see the different places: the uh, Temple of Creation, the Temple of Life, the woven mat, and we see an initiate. And then we go over to the other side, and we see six initiates that are male and female. They represent portals and different gods and goddesses related to the mushroom. And then we go down through the journey to where he comes out at the very bottom on the left, on the ball of creation as Talak facing the god Janus, you know, Quetzalcoatl. And we'll go through this and what these symbols mean next, but you have any questions about this? Yeah, I was going to chime in there. I just wanted to, to so, so just so people know those things that look like horse troughs or little aquariums, th- those symbolize the river. That um, symbolizes the river and the cave near the river. And this is the Pacific River uh, called the Utah Tono, I, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing it right, uh, wrong, but in a cave near the river where this this uh, is considered symbolic of this ceremony. And w- the reason water was in there is there's often a concept of burning water, the opposite of two antagonistic things. You got water and fire, right? Right. And this aspect of burning water, you're setting yourself on fire and your soul and spirit on fire to become Quetzalcoatl. And to be reborn to the sun, out of the underworld, not Hades, but the underworld. So back to the four lizard and the eleven lizard. Do those is the the, the number that's associated with them? Is that the amount of mushrooms, or what, what's that? Num- what does the number symbolize? Well, as far as I know, and I don't want to say any more than I that I know is that the four lizard represents the mushroom before you take it, and eleven lizard after you've eaten the mushroom. And you're starting your, what they call viaje, which means journey, or velada. Sometimes these were at night, and it was considered a nighttime vigil, or sometimes it was during the day. Gotcha. But uh, now uh, you're in a different aspect of time. See, it relates to time. And all these symbols relate to how, when you're taking the sacred mushroom, time is changed. Oh, I mean, absolutely. anybody that's taken psilocybin, right. psilocin, or any type of uh, uh, psychedelic mushroom, I think that's one of the main things is time is just... Um, the night seems yeah, to I mean, last forever. Yeah, when you come down, you you, you know, you can start to put things into perspective again, but uh, when you're in it, nothing else matters. You're just in it, you know? Well, they've shown, unlike LSD, which locks itself into the brain, that psilocybin is, is as safe as water or aspirin. I mean... You could overdose on water, but it's it's not toxic and it doesn't attach itself anywhere in the body. But the amazing thing, when they roll people laying down flat in these MRI machines, 
they expected to see the brain all lit up and everything on psilocybin, but they noticed the part of the brain that relates a lot to the ego and fear is at the front, the part that relates what's going on in the past, right now in the future. So, you know, you're thinking there and it's almost like you can think about three things at the same time, past, future, and now, and you're making your decisions on that. And, uh, yeah, I think they correlate a lot of anxiety uh, and depression, and it all shuts down. That all goes away. Right, you're just here and now. Yeah, they correlate fear. I think the amygdala is the part of the brain that's associated with the fear center of the brain. Right. So back so to the so uh, the um, the codex here. So we were just at the, he was on the uh, the ball in the river, um, and then you were. I think you were. Um, that's, well, that's where, a ball of creation. So what is that? So the ball of creation, why is that in the river? Well, it's it's more symbolic. You notice him going in the river, right? Right. And, the, and, and he's the initiate going in, and he's representing a male or female priest or priestess or follower of Quetzalcoatl, the followers of Quetzalcoatl. And they're going into the river, and you see the... Their life is not together. The three reeds there that has been held in a hand. Their life is in chaos and earth is a slippery pace and they got to find balance. And then at the very bottom, you find the knot tied, but that represents a ball of creation. And there's sort of like four directions related to the four different parts of the uh, directions of the earth. And that's footprints. You can obviously see footprints on them. Well, the whole idea was to be in balance. And of course, in that top picture, you're not in balance. The ball's just floating and you don't have any control or balance in your life. And in the bottom picture, the foot is on the ball and it's in balance. Hmm. And uh, basically, you're in balance in your life. I mean, that makes sense. Yeah. Right. And then you have the different symbols, like I said, the one up there with the symbol where he's going head first, he's plunging into the abyss mm -hmm. of the river, into the crevice. The symbol there is a symbol for time, which is like, it means like, for instance, a mushroom ceremony is typically eight to 10 hours, sometimes six, it might go as long as 12, but it's typically eight to 10 and it peaks in about six hours. But during that time, it feels like you've gone through an eternity and we could describe a lot of the things that may happen, but the time just, just seems to be forever. But that's what that symbol there is, is that time as we discussed it, seems to have sort of incredibly slowed down or stopped. And that's what that symbol means. Is there any debate over these uh, codices in terms of... Um, their meaning? Yeah, they're, well, not only that, but their connection to the psychedelics and the psychedelic ceremonies or the uh, mushroom rituals, or is that something that's pretty well known even within academic circles? Well, for, let's just back up on that a little bit. Okay. A person would almost have to be... All right, I don't want to say anything insulting. I'll just say it positive. <laughs> okay. Every everybody today recognizes that this has something to do with sacred ethogens. Okay. Now, Wasson talked about this. Carl de Bogie talked about this. Peter First talked about this. A lot of people and a lot of uh, Aztec scholars and everything. Uh, you know, have looked at this, Mexican and otherwise, and this particular page now is called, it's actually called by archaeologists and people that study ancient history, it's called the Mystec Mushroom Codex, and it knows it has a sacred ritual. Now, one thing I feel like I found out that nobody else did because I participated in this particular ceremony is if you see on the right side, up at the deities below where Quetzalcoatl is rasping the god of death and Xochipilli's there, a lot of people said, well, that black insect just represents night. No, it doesn't. What that, They don't know what the black... Hmm. I was the first one to really say what the black insect re represents, which is obvious. They had a black bee that made the honey that was taken with the sacred mushroom. 
I mean, even the Spanish priest, as little as they wrote, knew, knew two things, that honey was taken with the mushroom in these sacred ceremony, and also cocoa was taken. Now, they didn't know how, you know, uh, or the things, but they knew the sacred honey. Well, the Aztecs didn't have the honeybee of the African honeybee that's like there today, which is the same honey. That It makes the same type of honey. But they had a little black bee like a wasp that made honey uh, in much thinner cones. And mm. I've actually have that. My curandero gave me some of that. And it's the same honey. It can be used. But that's the one thing they didn't know. Now, a lot of them don't know about the sacred ceremony of the deified heart. But I say in a lot of this, there's an aspect of taking the sacred mushroom and gazing into this. You understand this was made for a noble or a high priest when he took the sacred mushroom to gaze into. And sometimes on the mat they were in, that's when they'd go into the astral traveling or weaving of the mat, or they'd have a situation where Quetzalcoatl would come. But this is like a guide. This mm. isn't just a story about this. This is also a guide. So, and you were explaining um, to anybody that watched before, we did do an episode before, but the audio was messed up. But in that episode, uh, you were talking about how you ingest these mushrooms, which is you ingest the family or the, the cluster of them living with honey. Is that correct? Well, you typically a day before you fast the day before and usually that day and you do whatever is spiritual for you or other, but you don't talk. The one thing you try not to do is talk to people. And usually there's a fire bit built in the four directions where you're looking for the sun to set or wood is gathered, but about three hours before, sometimes four, you drink raw cacao beans. And I brought some beans along to show people. A man's prepared You get for these type of beans episode. that you get that are uh, beans you could order on the internet that are still uh, uh, unpeeled. Mm, okay. And you, you, you take these beans and you uh, make a cacao drink. Gotcha. And some people add honey wow. to it, but it's mainly chocolate, but it has two neural transmitters. The story was Quetzalcoatl gave it to his followers as an aphrodisiac, and the other he gave it as a precursor to the sacred mushroom because of the two neural transmitters in it uh, are bliss transmitters. And they make you happy and everything. But then when you take this sacred ceremony, so what is one of those using live mushrooms, not dried mushrooms? Is the cacao is that? So do you mean like uh, the transmitter is that oxytocin? Do you know? Because that's um, that's I, I, it sounded like that's what you were kind of describing as oxytocin. Well, there's one page in my book on it where I describe the uh, different chemicals in it. One is PA, which is when two people are in love and neither one of them's feet hit the, hit the ground. They both think they're an angel. Mm -hmm. That particular chemical is being made. And then there's another bureau trans neuro, uh, bliss transmitter. Plus the uh, theobromine is like coffee as a stimulant, but it's much, much better for you. And uh, like I said, it, it's chocolate is known to be an aphrodisiac, mm -hmm. but this is much more yeah. powerful. And, but basically the secondary use was to get ready for the ceremony a couple of hours before to get you ready so that you would be in a good mood. Gotcha. That makes sense. You know, so you wanted to have some anticipation, but you didn't want to be intense or worried about that. You ought to be overjoyed. And then you would go on this celebration overjoyed that you're going to meet Quetzalcoatl. And then when the, the sacred mushrooms, when you gather them around, uh, you sing to them, mm. and they're living in bowls, or maybe you've grown them, but they're living, or you've got them in the woods, or brought in cow patties, and you're singing to them with your heart and thanking them for being the holy flowers of the blood, and you're thanking them for enabling you to see Quetzalcoatl, and you're also thanking them that they're food, like food for the body, just like corn. And so you're saying these prayers and singing, they'll actually start to dance on their stipes. They'll start moving back and forth. Now, I don't like mean like a person, but they'll actually start moving. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes at the start of the ceremony, a conch shell is blown. 
And that was very simple. That, that means we're going to start, you know, we're going to eat the mushrooms. And sometimes four candles are lit. But the but the conch shelf itself was very important. In other words, Quetzalcoatl actually wore it around his uh, neck. Mm. And in some cases, a jaguar whistle was blown too. But then when you ate the mushrooms, you took, two mushrooms at a time because that represented male and female and you covered them in honey. Now, when you put them in your mouth, you chew, 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 masticate. You never swallow and you keep eating them and eating them. And what happens is the roof of your mouth, your tongue and your gums go straight to the spine and they go straight in the bloodstream to the brain and the inside of your cheeks, the inside of your cheeks right here go straight through the bloodstream to the ventral aorta of the heart. Well, when you're taking live living mushrooms, they're basically carbohydrate and maltose. And to get in it, technically, the saliva in your mouth and the honey are changing that into pure glucose. And the, all the psilocybin is being transmitted into psilocin. Mm -hmm. And it's going straight in the bloodstream. It's going straight right in the bloodstream, right into your spinal cordum and your brain. It sort of almost seems to hit that at the same time and at the ventral aorta of the heart. And when this happens, it's like, in a way your body is being set on fire. When you're eating them, you just keep eating. All of a sudden, you'll feel like you're disappearing. All of a sudden, there's your body's disappearing, and you, you can feel the rigidity of your skeleton, and it's disappearing. And the next thing you know, your skull and teeth are disappearing. And then it seems like you're coming out of that and your spine is starting to move and it's starting to move like a serpentine snake. It's moving all over and you, it just feels really good. feels incredible. I don't give it any name. I just describe what's happening. Like I said, a lot of people call that the Kundalini. But then after that, you start to look up and that's when the jeweled wing rainbow serpent starts to come made of millions and millions of diamonds but it does look like a serpent but it's man size and this serpent is coming and all this rainbows and different colors are coming out of the light and typically the followers of Quetzalcoatl during that ceremony uh they they walked into Quetzalcoatl and walked into him and became Quetzalcoatl now some people in the healing parts of the ceremony if they were healing something let Quetzalcoatl swallow the sage or the curandero, and it also swallowed the uh, patient to be healed. But when you get swallowed or it's uh, you walk into him, it's like pure, pure white light. And it's just like you feel total empathy, total love, and you realize the power of all this. And it's incredible. And you feel like uh, life has been conquered over death. But the reason why it's a great healing ceremony is because you realize by breathing like... <sighs> and stopping at different places in your spine. I don't mean holding it there for a long time or anything, but breathing in and breathing air, you're pulling all this oxygen in your blood and your heart's starting to come alive and it's pulsating. And that's why they call it the deified heart. And even people that are there, that are non-participants, if they look at somebody and they look at their, uh, and there's all sorts of people have seen this. It looks like lights are coming out of your eyes. It looks like a flashlight's behind each eye. And that's bio photons coming out. The eyes can send light. But your whole face is starting to glisten. And they consider that your soul life was now being imprinted on your body. And your whole body was starting to glow. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying if you're a non-participant, you can see this. It's just amazing. It's just so much energy that's coming out. And the energy and the sheer power of love and empathy and kindness. And uh, Quetzalcoatl and having this feeling... And then after this ceremony was over, the people that have been in it have gained the right, even today, to, to call themselves Quetzalcoatl or call somebody else Quetzalcoatl. I just typically call myself a follower of Quetzalcoatl. But these ceremonies are still being done. Now, I don't mean that Quetzalcoatl doesn't come in other ceremonies. He right. does come in other ceremonies. And I've seen him come when people have used dried mushrooms with honey. Hmm. and masticate them and never swallowed and it went in yeah you but, make a good point about the uh, masticating too because i mean anybody that's eaten mushrooms i think the more you chew and suck on them the more quickly and intense uh, it seems to come on uh, we talked about this last time too yeah it's just like putting an aspirin on your tongue 
Right. But the, but the thing I'm trying to go over here is like uh, uh, lots of other people have seen Quetzalcoatl and seen these Aztec deities and seen this stuff. And it's uh, like I've done a ceremony with a Russian midget, uh, escaped in the Second World War from Russia. I've done it with a Vietnamese a uh, Buddhist guy that came from Vietnam. He was one of the people over there when we came after the war. Neither one of these had a clue. They'd never heard about Quetzalcoatl, never any of this. And they all saw the sacred jaguar. They saw these Aztec motifs, just like Albert Hoffman did when he took this in Switzerland. So you're opening up a parallel world, and you're coming out of this with a lot of wisdom and the relation and the ability of animism, like to talk to plants, not like you and me are talking, but to, you know, understand how the living world out there is talking to you right and that's that you know you pointed out the uh the uh, jaguar and that's what you know there's videos of jaguars chewing on uh vines in the jungle that looks like they're tripping on dmt um well they're eating uh yagi leaves they're eating leaves of the benastaris copia which ayahuasca is made from right right and uh so that's when people do these ceremonies and stuff a lot of people do see the jaguar which you've pointed out it seems like there's some sort of connection whether it's a metaphysical uh connection maybe there's some sort of weird telekinetic thing going on i mean who really knows exactly but uh it's definitely an interesting My buddies named their channel after them yeah we have a, a couple of buddies that have a um a channel dedicated to that kind of stuff it's called uh, dreaming jaguars but uh yeah, I mean, in terms of, um, like I said, you pointed out some good things, um, and also the connection between these ceremonies uh, in the entheogens and um, some of the sacred imagery. Um, but do you think that uh, do you think it's necessary to for the ceremony to to produce these images, or do you think that people experience these things, you know, without being part of the ceremonies or doing them on their own or whatever the case may be? I would say 99% of, 0.99% of the planet, people on the planet can't do this because these open up neural links in your brain. And there are ancient plants that are open up these links and these different people have discovered these ceremonies and rituals for this to happen. And, uh, uh, I'm not saying it's not possible. There are some people that their brains may be wired in such a way that they're like this all the time, you know, but for most people, they have to take some sort of sacred ethogen to do this. Hmm. That makes sense. Um, so let's get back to the slide here. Do you want to stay on this one or do you want to go to the next let's one? Let's go to the next one. Okay. Because I think this goes more... As we go through this, we can progress, and we see at the very bottom what you call the trough, which represents a river. Right. And the unbalanced life with the hole in the three strands that they're not tied together. And we see the two, like, deities of the river, and they're like uh, what are called nuhus. They're one of them is red and one of them is blue, and they're sort of like... Uh, spirits of the river that represent the actual spirits in the water in the river. Now above them is Quetzalcoatl in his uh, like regalia. Mm -hmm. And here we see a representative four lizard, the, the sacred mushroom who's behind the Carandero with the white hair and the white beard or the ancient sage or priest. And they're at the beginning of the ceremony talking about intent and what's going to happen, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, this is uh, the beginning of this ceremony. And right now, see, Quetzalcoatl is starting to get ready to do the sacred ceremony. But let's go to the next slide. Okay. Now we see Quetzalcoatl above. And he has more like regalia on. And four lizard, which you see like the mushroom in the ground, the living mushroom, and the lizard in front of him with four red dots and the four mushrooms on his head. Mm -hmm. Now it's been taken by Quetzalcoatl, or in essence taken by you. And you see once it's absorbed, 
it's now a leaven lizard, and you see the lizard on top of his head with two groups of five dots in one, and he's walking toward the valley of death. And this is a sort of a symbolic. He's considered a leaven wind now, and he's uh, he's walking into this particular valley where Talak lives. And that represents Talak. And Talak was like sort of his faithful friend, but the, at the same time, Quetzalcoatl could turn himself into uh, Talak. And now we see above the symbol of Sochapili with a tear in his eye because he's overjoyed. And we see the black bee that represents a honey. And then we see uh, Quetzalcoatl, who's cut off the head of death. He's free the ego and you from the fear of death. And that's really been banished to the underworld. And he made a special instrument, which he's scraping the head with. And that's when your body starts to resonate and you start to resonate on the mat and you can feel your body resonating with the earth. And that's why a lot of people in this ceremony will start humming. Their whole body will start humming. That happened with me with Maria Sabina, but that humming and resonation is meaning like they're getting ready to go into this parallel world and you see coming out of Quetzalcoatl's mouth the images and stuff are springing out the song he's singing is springing forward it's not something that he's thinking about it's coming from within him this is all coming out of the body that the body's doing this and it's all coming from within it's a greek poetic sort of thing mm -hmm. uh where it's not like a song you're thinking of the lyrics and singing it's springing forth henry munn h-u-m-n has written an incredible article called The Mushrooms of Language, and it's all about this. He also, another article called The Uniqueness of Maria Sabina, but better than I could ever do without copying him is uh, his The Mushrooms of Language, which is online. He also translated Estrada's book about the life of Maria Sabina from Spanish to English. But this type of resonance, your body resonating, you're all this sort of resonating is you're starting to resonate with the earth itself. And all of this that's springing out is springing forth because it's coming out without being connected to time and thinking about what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Let's go to the next slide now. Unless you want to ask a question. No, I was, I was just going to say, though, um, I think we've if you've done a decent amount of uh, psilocybin or mushrooms, you do feel that coming up, that vibration feeling. Um, and I'm sure it's even more powerful when you do the ceremony. But um, do you think that um, that's what makes, I think, I mean, I personally enjoy psilocybin much more than let's say like LSD and um, MDMA, that kind of stuff, only because I feel like there's, it's a more of a body feeling too. And it just feels like, you know, I mean, scientifically, you know, it's playing off of your 5-HTP2A receptors and it's replicating serotonin throughout your body. And most of that's considered in your gut so or in your gut. So when most people get that sinking feeling in their gut when they're about to come up, that's probably what's happening. It's, um, you know, changing into psilocin in your, in your body. But do you think that um, these rituals do have an effect when you do that, like a more of a um, like you said, like a spiritual connection to what's going on? Well, I just think having a ritual is a spiritual thing. And like using language, like I tell people, don't use the word magic. Don't use the word uh, psychedelic. Don't use the word uh, hallucinogenic, for God's sakes. You know, there when Watson and not a lot of people got together, they, even, they said, we have to find a new word because all these other words are really barbaric. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, the word psychomagnetic had been tossed around for a while, but then they used created the word E N T H E O G E N to refer to plants that create the God within. Well, the difference between the right word and the wrong word is the difference between lightning and a lightning bug. And you, if you don't use the word like sacred and consider this a sacrament and do it in ceremony, it's taking you through portals right there. So, and it's the aspect of what you're doing this and how it's approaching it that's a very valuable thing. But these people that did these sort of ceremonies and what Quetzalcoatl taught, these goes back centuries, centuries. I mean, even thousands of years with ayahuasca and peyote and, uh, you know, St. Pedro. 
and the sacred mushroom. And, and these people that were the Kurunderos, the wise people, and, and different indigenous tribes give them different names. That's why I hate when people use the word shaman, because it's almost like totally disrespectful. You should use the native language name or at least the la a recognized language of the country. And But nevertheless, these traditions go back a long period of time, and it's sort of like these people have learned how to do these. And the way I explain it is sort of like this. And I'll sort of flip this over on itself. Imagine you were like a native somewhere. Let's just put you in Australia and you're an Indian and you live in primitive conditions. And all of a sudden you come up across an airport and all these planes are on the airport, right? Mm -hmm. You've never seen a plane. You've never seen an airport in your life. Well, that's like Western men to a great extent. And even Asians that found this now, obviously, you would want to have a Curandero or somebody like Maria Sabina or somebody to teach you and go with you, or you would want to find somebody that had these ancient traditions or at least some sort of guide from somebody who had done it where the other people say, get out of here, I'm getting in the jet and I'm going to turn on the key. Now, I think there are some people, maybe like Terrence McKenna and other people that have a natural affinity. And but I but I feel like a lot of these people, when I see people, especially after the 90s, talking about this, it's very narcissistic, relating solely to themselves and what their what their feelings are themselves and how it affects them. Rather than looking, I think, at the, more the ancient traditional ceremonial sort of use and definitely the difference between big pharma and academia and the universities, which is a joke. I mean. That they may be doing a lot of good, and I'll just say it, you know, they're laying people on the couch, they're putting binders on them, they're giving them a pill, mm -hmm. and they're playing Mozart. Look, go out in the wilderness, go out in a secluded garden during the day and take this, and you'll hear the greatest music you can ever hear when it rains, the birds, the trees. It's greater than any orchestra you could ever hear. You'll see these spirits come out of the trees and everything, and they're all your friends, and you'll see all these people in this parallel world. And when it rains, it's just like the most heavenly noise and the birds and the sounds out there in the wilderness are like the greatest orchestra you could ever hear. You don't need to hear Mozart. or, uh, I mean, you know, and you're finding all these people that are coming to talk with you. It's just, uh, you know, I hear all these people talking in uh, like Michael Pollan in his book, but there's nothing about the spirituality in there. About the only person that talks about anything spiritual today is Dennis McKenna. You know, it's... Uh, I just think uh, academia doesn't allow people to do this privately. A lot of people have talked to you about this and what they've experienced, but I mean, you're right you about know. the woods for sure. I mean, I remember, I think the largest dose of psilocybin I've taken was like 10 grams dried and it was a lot. It was very powerful, very potent. And I was out into nature and it seemed like everything just dissolved uh, into one thing. Everything just melted away into this one thing. Um, and it was probably one of the most powerful experiences I've had, but being out in nature, there was this different connection than opposed to, let's say, sitting in a house or listening to music or watching TV or whatever the case may be. Yeah. You're surrounded by 60 Hertz AC electrical cycles, and you've got all these preformed images on the wall, which are a Paul prayer of being on a box in the matrix. And when you're out in nature, nothing duplicates itself. You know, you're seeing things from a really original standpoint. And it's such a difference in what you can experience, especially when you're on, you know, ethogens. And I don't know anybody that doesn't do it from a spiritual standpoint, mm -hmm. doesn't have these sort of experiences. Absolutely, no. I, I agree. Uh, so let's go to the, do you wanna stay on this one or do you wanna go to the next one? Let's go to the next one. Well, we just point up above. Okay. That represents a regular initiate and that's like uh, the, the wall of creation and I think the wall of life, and that wall represents a ceremonial mat. And this is, the initiate's just representing the average guy there. You know, he's not a god or deity or the average person. And they have the two mushrooms representing the female and female, and they're get, getting ready to be initiated in this. Now we can go to the next one. Okay. Okay, well, this 
Let's go back to the other one for just a second. Okay. Okay. Now you see the black bee on the extreme right in Quetzalcoatl scraping the head of death. In front of him is Sochipilli, the Sud Prince. And that's who we're going to be looking at in the next slide. So go to it. Okay. I have a whole entire chapter of my book, and I mentioned the Sun Prince a lot. This was a sacred Aztec god that was found buried. Uh, almost every single book you see about sacred mushrooms that has anything to do with the archaeology or the Aztecs will show you this, which is in the Museum of Anthropology in Mexico City, which is an incredible place. But you see Xochipilli is the god of ethogens, and he's obviously in ecstasy because he, in this particular thing, he sees Quetzalcoatl coming, and you can see his face in ecstasy at about a 35th degree angle looking up, and one of his earrings is one of the sacred mushrooms. And then you start to see all over his body symbols, like in his front, the river of life, but if you look at his legs and arms, and then if you look at the side, you can see there's two stylized mushrooms, and there's also uh, the tendrils of the morning glory, and there's also uh, the tobacco leaf, which is used as a poultice a lot and rubbed on different parts of the arms as a poultice during a ceremony. And then you see uh, what's called olakiki, or Rivia corimbosa, or Turbina corimbosa, which is like a huge vine. Mm -hmm. And see the flowers that it grows, it's got a incredible white flowers with a purple, real dark purple center with a yellow, uh, you know, stem and the part sits out that has all the pollen on it. But it grows as a vine as big as your arm and it can't take freezing conditions. Uh, but this was a god of flowers, it was a god of song, it was a god of dance, but it was also a special god of uh, young people and sacred uh, ethogens. Yeah, and just so you know, somebody did comment uh, the when we did the one before, and I did look it up. Uh, Morning Glory does contain LSA. Um, obviously, LSD is the man-made production of it, but LSA, lysergic acid, is the active compound in the uh, morning glory flower and seeds. Also in the uh, Rivia corimbosa. Now, not every morning glory has it. It's the heavenly blues that has the uh, LSO, I guess you said. <laughs> and LSA, yeah. LSA in the uh, Rivia corimbosa, which I'd like to grow here in North Florida, but it just can't take freezes. Gotcha. But, you know, morning glories to come back, but I just grow them for their beauty because to me, these ethogens are more like, you know, as I mentioned yesterday, a firecracker compared to the bottle rocket, you know, right. the sacred mushrooms. Uh, that makes and sense. Uh, we can go to the next slide now if you want. Okay. Now we're on the other side, and these six deities represent people that are uh, like one death, nine grass, nine herb, one eagle lady. Uh, they're all different avatars. The one eagle lady, the, oh, what is it? Nine grass, nine herb, one death. See the head of death? Mm -hmm. And basically, they're symbolic of different types of divination, clairvoyance, astral traveling, different aspects of portals of the mushroom. And then in the next slide down, we're seeing the initiate who's going into the burning waters. He's going into the crevice. And the ball of creation is loose. And now we're seeing also as he's going in, the strands, his life is not together yet. He's still out of balance. He hasn't achieved balance. And we see the symbols of like the A with the flint in it and the flint below, which is a representative symbol that time is really slowed down. Time is different than normal time that, you know, that eight or 10 hours might seem like 
sort of an eternity, but it passes, you know, in, in the eight to 10 hours, but it's a totally different type of time. Right. And then below, we see Quetzalcoatl as Talak and his uh, Jaguar regalia facing uh, an avatar of Talak that is like Janus that is facing forward and backward in time. Now, now let's go to the next slide. This is, again, sort of a close-up of this symbolism. And, of course, in the middle bottom, you can see symbolizing death. I think the one on the extreme right at the top is Eagle Woman. Certain other of these represent different herbs, but they're all representing gods, but not gods as we think of, but more as forces of energy. Uh, Olin energy, Malini energy, and Nepali energy. It was energy like of uh, uh, oscillating back and forth or energy that was like a weaving back and forth or... Uh, an up and down sort of energy that was related to energy and motion. And when you take the sacred mushroom, a lot of times you can see this and you can use these sort of things to heal or heal yourself or even go into uh, some sort of like astral traveling or divination or see the future. Or uh, All of these are symbolic images of representing atop a portal for the sacred mushroom and an aspect of that, like one eagle represents a feminine side. Mm. Let's go to the next slide. Well, I, I want to ask you, uh, is there any significance? Some of them are holding two mushrooms. Some of them are holding one mushroom. Is there anything to that? It sort of represents symbology. Usually two represents male and female. Okay. And I don't know why the person is holding the one mushroom uh, exactly. Maybe they're I, lonely. I, yeah. And uh, they also have different aspects of representation of these dots and symbols, Bob. And that little thing that looks like a fish float is actually a piece of flint. Mm. Ah. That makes sense. All right. We'll go to the next one here. Well, this is the one where you're back in time and you've come out of the crevice and now you have the ball of creation and your foot's on it and you have it balanced. And that was the whole thing to gain balance in life and to gain your balance and ability to be uh, have a life in balance instead of out of balance. And that's why you see now when you come out of this, the cord there that's tied together, yeah. that means that you've left uh, and you're, and now you've achieved balance in your life. You put together the male and, and the female principles and uh, you've achieved this balance. And then above you see Quetzalcoatl and this time he's holding three mushrooms and he's facing back into the past and into the future representing you've been able to see yourself, you've been able to divine and see into the future and to recreate yourself and be reborn now. And this is this has something to do too with um, each initiate sort of bringing their own life story and character to this. This is sort of considered the trinity of man, God, and goddess in the ascension of mankind to the sun and our connection to the deity of that spark of divinity of life is in our life and this is a a spiritual development for controlling you know the sexual male female that's why the the blood of quetzalcoatl's penis was where these mushrooms grew because of all the sexual energy representing male and female energy is what we have to have in balance and the, the two religious knights are also a symbolic of singing to what's called the pyramid of the sun mm -hmm. and uh, the sun in all its glory, you know, is initiating the rebirth. The, uh, is the sacred ceremony of the deified heart. And you're now going to experience, you know, like a new life and clairvoyance powers of foresight. All of these things, you know, are involved in this. 
so I guess, you know, we've sort of gone through the, the codex, the ancient codex. You can see this online. And, uh, you know, but this is what I, I, I was talking about. There's two different things that really tell the story of the deified heart. And one of them is the codex, the Vienna codex or the Uto Tono, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing it wrong, uh, Mistech, which means people of the rain, people of the clouds. Mm. You know, they live in the mountains down there in, in Oaxaca. So it's considered the people of the rain or the people of the clouds. And they, uh, this was drawn, they know this was drawn down in this area and put together in this area, but it was found. Uh, Cortez out, took it out of Montezuma's uh, palace. Montezuma had two main books up there, this one and the other books that described what all the plants and animals, how they could be used for everything. Everything from sacred ceremonies to eating to weaving to dyes to textiles. Gotcha. So do you want me to go to the next? Yeah. Okay. Now we're basically here going to talk about, for a short period, about the Eagle and Jaguar Knights, they were all called Eagle Knights. And uh, even though they're called Eagle Knights, they had two groups that represented day and night. The Eagle Knights and the uh, representing day and the Jaguar Knights at night. And these were like Kung Fu type of spiritual, you'd say Buddhist type of knights that were the also like the seals. They were unbelievably trained to suffer heat and pain and days without eating and even injure their bodies with thorns and stuff and still be able to carry on. This is a very, very, very sort of a, a step group that their goal was also, they were followers of Quetzalcoatl. And this is uh, way in the mountains where they had a fortress called Malenko. And this is a picture from it from a day, and it was carved out of a mountain uh, near Malenko. And that's why it's called the Temple of the Eagle uh, or the Temple of Malenko, which you can visit today. Now, if we go to the next picture, we can see it was literally carved out of the mountains. Every single feature of this is carved as one piece out of the mountain. There wasn't anything carved and taken here. This was a very, very isolated where they held this, these sacred ceremonies. And this was the only fortress that was never taken there by the Spanish. They had battles there, but finally the Spanish just gave up. And I think it, it was so isolated and out of yeah. the way that they simply just didn't want to, there wasn't any worth in taking it. Yeah. Uh, Thank God and, it was preserved. I mean, that makes sense. It's kind of like, uh, what's that site in, um, oh, Petra in the uh, Middle East, how the Bedouins could live there and nobody else could, and they were constantly being attacked, but uh, they were able to live with very little water and they had their own techniques. So people had a tough time battling them in their own environment because they were so good at surviving there and everybody else wasn't. Seems kind of similar to this. Yeah, or there wasn't anything to guess. Like the Weechos that live in the Sierra Madres North, they don't live in a particular city. They live in all these little rancheras and come together for celebrations. So there's nothing back there to conquer unless you want to get a goat or two and a little bit of land that would take you two weeks by a donkey to get there. Right. Uh, so this was discovered in 1938. It wow. was rediscovered. In 1938, it was found by an archaeologist. If we go to the next picture, we can sort of see a picture from that era when it was discovered and after the battles and everything and how a lot of this looked. Yeah, uh, pretty clean. Looks like they did a good job with that stonework. Yeah, everything was carved straight out of the mountains. Uh, these people were incredible artists and art, our, uh, artisans and making jewelry and regali and headdresses and everything and and they had incredible dances like they practiced these dances forever for these ceremonies and boy did you get in trouble if you make a misstep during a dance hmm. you know uh th this these were really sacred religious sort of events that they'd have and have these dances and wear these feathers and play this music and the dancers especially uh had to get everything exactly right to them it was a very spiritual thing this you know, it, it had a lot of meaning to it. Now, if we go on to the next slide, 
we can see sort of how it looks today and how they've set it up for the tourists to go there. And there's a lot of higher fans of uh, the sacred mushroom or mushroom sages or followers of Quetzalcoatl that do sacred mushrooms in the mountains nearby, or they come to this place because it's considered a sacred place to them. Uh, but this is designed, you know, that the regular tourists can go there. And as you see those four poles holding this up, you see the opening to the mouth that you're going to through. That was like the mouth of the uh, serpent. And then yeah. the next picture, if we on that, we can see on one side one of the oh, no, this is a one of the jaguar knights. It's just a picture of a drawing from that era. Okay. Can we go to the what next a jaguar one? like in his regalia because he would have been going into this after drinking cacao he would have been dancing and singing mm. and then we go to the next picture and we can see the typical regalia of the eagle knights and the eagle knights and jaguar knights had to take four people alive in battle to, to gain the, the basic status to be a knight and uh these eagle and jaguar knights, the one thing about them in battle, they absolutely did not fear death at all. They had absolutely no fear of death. Well, if you imagine you have soldiers that are intelligent, that are trained for a lot of times, that are picked from the elite, and they've gained this status from these, uh, they're going to be, but they were considered, you know, the prime protectors of the empire. Mm. Oh, let's go to the next picture. And actually, I, we talked about that last time, but they found a suit and like, I think it was either an ancient Mayan city or something. It looked like Batman, kind of like an ancient Batman <laughs> yeah. suit. Yeah, I think that was down toward the middle and it looked like real like the... Well, see, the Batman sort of people were considered... Uh, the bats were considered very sacred. You know, the, the uh, Mesoamericans from the Toltecs who existed way before the Aztecs and all these people uh, really had a relationship to the earth in between night and day. And, of course, the bat was very symbolic of night, just like the owl is. And as I mentioned before, there were some of these Aztec priests that would have these fires that they would make with ashes. And they would put live scorpions and rattlesnakes in there and burn them and then rub these ashes all over their body and take mushrooms and go out at night. That's crazy. They, they, yeah, they went out like at night, and uh, I certainly wouldn't want to meet one of these people at night. And, uh, and even during the day, they would be wearing these black ashes all over them because they were they were considered people of the night. These mm -hmm. particular priests, and and they represented the night even during the day, and and uh, they were expected to live under extreme conditions of. Uh, meditation and fasting and that's that sort of thing mm. but as you see here representing quetzalcoatl we have one of the eagle or jaguar knights riding on the head and you got to imagine this dragon being in motion everything was considered in motion and the scales are sacred mushrooms i mean it's pretty obvious that these scales are sacred mushrooms mm -hmm. but, so you're going on this velada this viaje and you're riding uh, to become and meet Quetzalcoatl. And so this is very symbolic of this. And you can see it was all carved out of the mountain. And I think behind that, where you see that aspect of leaning back, that's sort of like you're not falling because you're going forward in motion. Everything's real fast. Gotcha. But the wind is pushing you back. So it'd be like somebody getting whiplashed in a fast car or being on the back of, you know, some, you know, if it was a fantasy. Well, if you're riding down in the air really fast, you're not going to be standing up straight. Right, right. You, 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 you achieve your balance by your back somewhat, you know? Yeah, to anybody that's listening and not watching, the it's, it's Quetzalcoatl with somebody standing on the back, be, do, almost doing like what, like a back, like a back like bend. The yeah, like a yeah, back. like the Neo in the Matrix, I would think, like, you know, avoiding those bullets. Yeah, and, and his feet are on the head of the of the serpent, and he's riding him, and you can see the sacred mushrooms. There's about, what is it, eight of them or seven of them that are like scales going back. Right. If we go to the next slide, we 
can obviously see a battle went on there and part of the entrance chipped away, but Quetzalcoatl was drawn. You were entering into Quetzalcoatl. You were going to, by intent, to meet and become Quetzalcoatl. And so you were going into this entrance singing and dancing, and this is all carved out as one piece inside. Now, it is circular inside. The place where everybody sits down for the sacred ceremony is circular, and you start to see in the middle of the circle the eagle there, and back behind the eagle actually on the part of the carved place where you would sit, you see the head of a jaguar and like two paws. And if we go Have in... Have you done a ceremony here? The what? Have you done a ceremony here? No, I would love to. Or in the mountains nearby. Uh, do they still do them or is that... No, not really. Well, there are certain cults of people. Hmm. There are certain Mexican who are still mostly Indians and there are certain uh, Americans and Europeans that do this sacred ceremony in the mountains, but they don't... They're not telling anybody about it. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, I got These you. are small groups of what I call hierophants, or I call them uh, different groups, like tribes of people that usually there's a dozen or left. Like a lot of them go to the different pyramids during the solstices and uh, equinoxes to do sacred ceremonies. But let's go to the next picture. Okay. Now you see sort of a close-up, so you can see how intricately it was carved this is the eagle facing you in the front and it's sort of bowl like with its wings out and you see the jaguar in the back and his eyes facing out to you and his mouth open and the jaguar's mouth was often shown open because it represented what you had to achieve uh, in life uh let's go to the next slide why do you think there's always seems to be two um animals associated with a lot of like ancient um symbolism and mythology and ancient psychedelic use i mean in egypt they've got the uh the falcon and the serpent you know here we've got the eagle and the jaguar uh i think the sumerians same thing was like eagle and a fish uh why do you think that that's the case do you think that's just well, a lot of it is representative like for instance the hummingbird both the egyptians and uh the aztecs had the hummingbird and it that represented certain things. Uh, certain things like frogs and t toads, for example, just simply represent, and rabbits represented things like fertility or they represented rain. Mm -hmm. They were just symbols of that. So if you're going to talk about rain and you show somebody a toad, then obviously in reeds, they're going to think, oh, you're talking about rain, right? Well, yeah, because toads come out right after it rains, pretty much. Yeah, and frogs, and you're hearing yeah, chirping frogs. and everything. Michael would know, too. He <laughs> loves those little guys. Well, I know. I mean, when you're younger, you know, we used to go in the woods and catch all sorts of stuff. And, uh, um, but yeah, the toads definitely come out and the frogs. Well, they, these, uh, they serenade me, me. Whenever there's rains out here behind my house, I get serenaded at night. I always make sure my window's open so I can hear them. I just love to hear oh, them. Oh, man, I, I love that. like there's uh, sort of like music there. Mm -hmm. I got to get out of the city. I love that stuff. <laughs> Now, if we go to the next one, we're sort of looking at it up from above so you can start to see the part of the circle and how you would sit going around to the door. And then the eagle or the sacred mushrooms would be put in and they would be taking honey, but these would be live living mushrooms in this eagle. You can see the wings spread back and the, ta and the tail feathers there. Mm -hmm. And so we mentioned basically the priest and priestess of Talak in the temple of Talak, who were the followers, and the Aztec, a lot of the, let's say the politicians and those sort of people didn't like them because they didn't believe in warfare and human sacrifice. But they needed them to make it rain, they needed them for healing, and they needed them for a lot of these ceremonies. So they allowed them to exist in Quetzalcoatl's follower, followers in the, in the temple of Talak because they used them for these purposes. They hadn't rained in a while, they'd say, okay, you guys go to the mountains, take mushrooms up there and make it rain. We need it to rain down here. And if you've ever taken mushrooms in the high mountains and clouds when they're passing by in electrical storms, it's really, 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 uh, you'll see a lot. You'll just see a lot. It's unbelievable. But uh, because of their ability for divination to see the future, 
and a lot of things. And then the Pocatecas, who were the traveling merchants who spread this all over the place. And of course, the Eagle and Jaguar Knights, because they wanted them to reach a point where they were beyond ever fearing death and fearing the ego mm. of, of dying. They had absolutely no fear. That makes okay, sense. Okay, next slide. Now, this is just a close-up. If you look at the paws and you look at the uh, ears and the mouth, you can see how incredible that is, you know, the carvings of that. Yeah, yeah that's pretty good. Uh, that these stone people were incredible that wood. what they did. Stone. Uh, their, their ability to make jewelry yeah. and all sorts of colors and art. Oh. Go to the next one now, I guess. Okay, now the reason I have this picture here is an artist's rendition of Tiwa Tiwa Khan. Quetzalcoatl created Tiwatiwakan, and if we compare the Aztecs, which that name didn't come along to the 19th century, they, there were three tribes of the Triple Alliance that came out of the desert. And Quetzalcoatl was the first Mesoamerican to make the connection of a deity in heaven. And there was a spark between the heavens and man and the earth below, and we could make that connection. And but when the Aztecs come out, imagine a bunch of Indians, say Apaches or Comanches, coming out of the desert and finding a place like Rome, and they claim, oh, our ancestors did all this. They did all this. These were, these were our ancestors that did this. But just like the Spanish destroyed stuff, the teachings that Quetzalcoatl taught about no warfare and no human sacrifice and peace and love and that sort of thing, they threw a lot of that away. Like I said, when they came out of the desert, they had a god, but only one god from an energy flow is with a war god, because previously they had just been ruled by witches. I mean, these people were very fierce people to be able to live in the desert, and so they come into Teotihuacan, but all this water you see, this isn't like, this is an artist's rendition of what it was like, actually like. This is basically cities that were incredibly made, and this pyramid here they've recently found under the center of it a tunnel and the tunnel underneath it at the very center at the bottom straight down they found a pool of mercury mm. oh yeah. And, yeah and that's on uh the discovery channel or national geographic or something and i have some friends that have gone in there with some indigenous people that somehow they were allowed to get in there at the solstice and the whole mercury starts to vibrate and you can feel the earth vibrating underneath and uh a lot of these places, it was incredible what would happen. Like at Chichen Itza, you know, these images are thrown that are just perfect of the of the serpent coming down. But it, but they believe this uh, pyramid was built specifically for the equinoxes and the solstices to vibrate. And these waters went all over the place, even into people's houses and stuff for baths and flowing through. No, this is all coming out of the mountains. Do you think they had any connection with any of this stuff to, like, you know, any archaeoastronomy type stuff? Like, Oh, uh, yes. It was constantly they were studying astronomy way more. Basically, they studied the skies, but they discovered, see, Venus has an 854-day rotation. Right. Earth 365, and the moon has certain rotations. Well, they had had, had people that pay attention for that stuff for years, and they actually knew on certain days when there'd be sunspots and that the blood in humans would start to vibrate in different owens. Uh, there's real, the Mayans really had this down about uh, how it would physically affect the body. Well, the reason you know, why, yeah, the reason why I point that out, though, is because if you look at the Giza complex from above, uh, you've got, it looks like almost Orion's belt offset, the three with the offset one. Same thing with Teo, uh, Teotihuacan. Uh, you've got the two larger pyramids and then the smaller one offset like Orion's belt. I was just curious if you thought that there was a connection with that or if... Uh... Oh, absolutely. Uh, everybody, you read about this stuff, uh, you read about how it was connected north-south and east-west and especially... Quetzalcoatl's temples faced at east, facing the dawn coming up, 
But the, all of this was oriented by different stars. And there was a lot of important reasons about this. You know, what a lot of people don't realize that pyramids, when the Nile, you know, wiped away everything, the land, you know, when it flooded. Right, right. The only way to figure out what was your property was by triangulation with certain pyramids. I mean, if you've got three pyramids, you could determine where all four corners of your land are, right. by how they line up. And yeah, of course, yeah. it was also related to the stars and everything else. And but for instance, they knew that Venus rotated counterclockwise. That was really amazing. Uh, these people had a much more of a concept of astronomy from a concept of the moon, Venus, and the Earth, and they had all sorts of symbols for that. They're related to that yeah. particular day. They. You know, they had a, a rotating sort of thing of how these symbols would rotate. You know, you've seen those sort of things like keys that rotate. Right. And they were basically alignments uh, at certain times and places of the moon, the earth and Venus and what that would mean to people. Yeah, I mean, it's crazy when you think back then, you know, obviously with modern technology and living in sheltered housing and, um, you know, all that stuff we're not confronted like they are, you know, like when it got dark back then, all you had was the stars and, um, you know, survival and different things and trying to figure different things out, having to do with the natural world. And now we live in a technology based world where the only people really studying the stars are amateur astronomers and, um, astronomers, cosmologists, that kind of a thing. So it's, it's, it's definitely interesting that anytime you go into the wilderness or somewhere where there's no, planes or something like that it's incredible uh the stars and the stars at night what you see and it's rare to find places in the united states i know there's one place supposedly in the united states i guess it's the government keeps it together where there's absolutely no electronic transmission of anything you can go to this place that's awesome no cell phones nothing there works electronically that's how it should. There should be more places like that. All right, let's go to the uh, next one here. Well, all around this pyramid was the plumed winged female male serpent, the Quetzal bird female that was a part of the dragon. And this is actually, but it's made of diamonds. What? The face of Quetzalcoatl looks like when it's coming to see you, made of all sorts of just millions and millions of diamonds that the facets are shining out light. And, you know, I talked about the uh, codex. Now what we're going to talk about is there were three stellas. They were called the stellas of Xochimilco. And these stellas were in the... Uh, highest temple, these three stellas, and they were also guides for the sacred mushroom ceremony there. And when the Spanish and the priests found them, these three guides of the sacred ceremony of the deified heart and the guidebook for Quetzalcoatl were broken into three pieces and painted red, which was an aspect of killing them and buried them so that they could get the ignorant savages away from quote unquote, knowing about these sacred ceremonies. Mm -hmm. that makes and sense. Uh, the, the stellars of the followers, the followers of Quetzalcoatl will often stare into these sacred veladas. Now, these statues were discovered in the Temple of Antiquity. They were dug up in 1960, 61 during that time period. And they were related to Tiwatiwakan and when the city was created. It was called the birthplace of mankind, and it sort of meant amongst the reeds. Now, this is uh, these stellas are now in the archaeological museum in Mexico City. I think they're in what's called the Temple of the Feather, and I've got some really good pictures. But one of the statues I really need to get the back of. Uh, pictures of it, but we'll go through this and look at the different stel of the three stellas now. Okay. Uh, uh, Do you want me to go to the next slide or? Yeah. 
Oh, this is before the three Stellas. This is a particular palace. And I wanted to talk about this. And you can sort of see the line. This is uh, one of the sacred Aztec palaces that had to do with the deified eye. The eye that's the all-seeing eye, the seizure intent, and also astral traveling and that sort of thing in the Chimera. In Wasson's last book, there's one that'll be released in 2026, but the last one he wrote, Persephone's uh, Quest, John Anathanot has a chapter in there where he talks about this disembodied eye. And all around this place, you can see these dots and pictures of the disembodied eye. Uh, and they're, they're placed in different places on the stone that represent the all-seeing eye of the sacred mushroom. So in connection, though, I mean, obviously we've got the, you know, the eye of providence or the all-seeing eye. It's it's in, you know, um, you know, Egyptian uh, hieroglyphs and culture and stuff, too. You've got the uh, eye of Horus, um, which some people relate to the uh, hippocampus region of your brain. Um, do you think that that's what they were up to with that or do you think it had a different meaning? Well, I think it it's sort of the same thing in the in the. Uh, on top of the dollar bill of the pyramid. I know in a sacred ceremony I was in, uh, I had this curandero, Francisco Ramides, and he held up a mushroom to me and pointed it at me, right at me. And he was questioning me about my intent, which was good, which is really a lesson he was teaching me about. At the start of a ceremony, you should really have an intent. You shouldn't be just like Indiana Jones running out in the jungle looking for something. You're conscious mind should have an intent. Now, once your conscious mind comes online with your subconscious and your living, breathing, intelligent body, you m may have a different lesson or go somewhere else or do something else different, but it's important to have an intent. And uh, to me, it was just like an eyeball. It looked exactly like an eyeball on the top of the rush mushroom looking at me and looking what to see what my intent was. Mm. And I know some other people, I've never done it, but I've known that they've astral traveled to a point where somebody's been there, I, you can actually see them go there in sort of holographic sort of form. Yeah, I mean, it's obviously in a lot of occult symbology and ancient symbology. I mean, we even have it on our logo. I mean, I'm, you know, ours is more correlated to my love of ancient Egypt, but uh, as you can see, it's obviously transcends other cultures as well, which is interesting. Well, I think there must be something click. There are certain ethogens or something, the way the brain clicks. And some of these people would do things like fast for long periods of time, and it causes the same thing. If you deprive the body of food yeah. for long periods of time, it's basically not going to make serotonin. If you don't, you have to have food to make serotonin, right? Right. Well, if you qu your body quits making serotonin, then some of these things start to happen. So that's why some of these people did things like deep meditation, fasting, or taking these other plants. And we talked about Syrian rue and the possibility of things. And there was like ayahuasca down in the uh, yeah, Amazon. They, but the sacred eye. I don't know. Uh, Did you know, too, that they just found it was um, a pouch of some, you know, shaman i think it was from like a thousand years ago it was like a fox snout pouch and they found yeah, my pouch i wish they'd give it back <laughs> and they found no, i mean I, I found i heard that they found all sorts of things in it yeah they found bufatine and uh harm harmine and dmt all sorts of stuff in there yeah and uh there's been you know like cannabis and especially cannabis in certain ways, like the Tibetan temple balls, when they make those. Yeah, and they found, uh, I believe, cocoa, or, um, uh, you know, the leaves from, you know, what they make cocaine out of as well. Sounds oh, like yeah, a party. Yeah, that goes way back because you can't maneuver in those mountains at that height without cocaine. I mean, the Andes are so high. I know when I get to 10,000 feet, like when I'm down there, I start talking to myself and answering back. Uh, <laughs> you know, the Spanish had to let the Indians use the coke coca leaves as the work in the mines and you know all of bogota there's coca flowers all over and uh yeah people chew them so are all over the place down there and you know it's it's uh it'll grow on the worst soil yeah from my understanding a lot of people down there don't you know even though they 
produced and made in the past, and I'm still sure continue to make uh, cocaine, which they press uh, the leaves and and create a uh, paste out of it that dries in the sun. But when they, they most of the indigenous people there don't actually use cocaine. It seems like a lot of them just chew. No, the, what they do is they the have coca these leaves, right? jars, right? Yeah, or little pedestals, and they grind up the coca leaf, which has tremendous amounts of niacin in it and vitamins, with seashells uh-huh. or with ashes, mm. and then they put them in their mouth. And you'll have, like you here in the South, you'll see a one-cut or two-cut guy. So the cocaine is going in through the leaf in a limited amount. Like if you say, okay, how should it have been done right in the United States? Well, if Wrigley's chewing gum, then you can only chew so much. And what they're doing is they're grinding up this coca leaves, and it has not only, like I said, what they need, the cocaine for the stimulant, but the niacin and other vitamins and so they're just making a sort of a tobacco chow with the uh, ashes and the seashells. Yeah, the way I understand it, it is like their version of chew or even like smoking a cigarette. Like it gives you that little nicotine buzz that you need to. Sounds like uh, you get way more out of it, though. Well, I'm nicotine sure. It doesn't really get you a buzz. I mean, it gives you a shitty buzz. It doesn't give you a nice energy buzz. I mean, if you're smoking a lot of cigarettes, yeah, that's true. But Well, I when mean, people go over the trains in the mountains, they actually pass out coca leaves on the trains to make sure that uh, you don't get awake. nauseous. Oh, that makes you're sense. You're actually oh, okay. them out. It's common. All right, well, let's go to uh, the next slide here. Okay, now we're starting to talk about the Stellas of Xochimilco, and these pictures are showing them somewhat in relief. And we're sort of seeing the uh, beginning of this physical, mental, and emotional journey to meet Quetzalcoatl and recreate his journey, this in the journey of the light of ascension. And uh, the picture on the left in the extreme center, you're seeing... uh, the initiate and the mouth of the jaguar going into the jungle with the teeth of the jaguar opening in the plume of Quetzalcoatl there. And I mean, going into the underworld, which is not Hades. And so he's in extreme sort of situation. And the other one of the three, there's one not shown. We're seeing the initiate coming out and being reborn. And he's in a combination mouth of the female eagle male, uh, serpent and the jaguar that he's coming out of. And as you can see sort of where these statues were broken and they put them back together, they're 55 inches tall, 16 on the two large sides and nine on the uh, uh, two other sides. Now, if we go to the next one, This is what I'm going to talk about with these Stellas, and I'm making sure I get some of this to get this right. Now, this is the first Stella, and as you look there, uh, at the very bottom, on the extreme left, that's representing the ceremonial mat. And you have cunixes on either side, and that's where heaven and earth meets. There's also the sacred jewels representing... uh, what's considered that symbolizes the sun and and the human heart. And the human heart is on the codex between, uh, like, on the mats. Now, these three stellas, they represented sort of what was called an ecstatic experience of the soul to transform yourself to Quetzalcoatl. The jaguar's fangs, they represent a fall from grace and a fall from joy in this world, that you've fallen from grace and uh, joy in the world. And that's why the initiate in the jaguar's mouth is exactly in the middle of the first uh, stella. The initiate's face is inside the mouth, and you can see there the jaguar and the female Quetzalcoatl are obviously like an ecstasy. Now, the disembodied serpent eye is at the top. You see that disembodied eye at the very top in the center? Yeah. That's surrounded by the female Quetzal fe- feathers. Hmm. Below the eyes, the urn, which the sacred mushrooms were put into, they were like put into this urn. 
at the very bottom, the two hands of creation are basically holding up and supporting the initiate that's above him. And this has to do with your sacred journey. And that disembodied eye at the very top is, is, is witnessing your journey, where you're eventually going to ascend as a jaguar eagle serpent. But the very top is the disembodied eye with the female quetzal feathers around it. Now, if we go to the smaller side, Talak in the center is represented like uh, with Venus. It's a symbol of both Venus and Talak, and you have uh, the bare feet there. Now, you can see the bare feet. They're yeah. symbolic of being on this mat in this sacred ceremony. They have to do with positioning yourself for the ascent into the underworld. And your disembodied eye soul is whispering to you during your journey. Now, the first Stella's disembodied eye is the sacred female fe feathers. But the rabbit at the bottom, if you could see the rabbit, that's Tolchi, and it's a part, it represents your soul life related to your life's energy. The rabbit sends, symbolizes a sacred attitude. This is an attitude, a religious attitude that everything is sacred. And it has to do with uh, transcendence and communication with nature and the spirit world. And the rabbit's going to lead you through this. Now, Tolchi represents, as a rabbit, self-sacrifice and that you're trying to become something greater than yourself. And it also brings the mystical forces, the moon in. And the sacred ceremony at Tiwatiwakan is at the very top of the second Stella. That's the sacred uh, ceremonial place. And you see below that the uh, ceremonial mat. And this is uh, related to Tiwatiwakan. Now, on the other nine-inch side, we see the rabbit Tolchi again at the top, and the initiate is inclined on a ceremonial mat below uh, the rabbit. Now, the double of Quetzalcoatl, the god of death, is being banished to the underworld, and that's where you also see the sacred corn. Before there could be any civilization, the corn had to come in, you know, come into being. And uh, this is symbolizing that your soul has made the sacrifices in the underworld for rebirth. You've given up the ego. You've given up uh, the idea that you're going to live forever or anything, and you're coming out for a world for other people and, and to self-sacrifice and, and be a good human. Mm. Now, let's go to the second Stella. Well, I guess what we're doing here, we're just seeing a close-up of this before. So, you know, you can really see those four dots recommend are uh, the four dots of blood of self-sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And you see the initiate that's inside the mouth of Quetzalcoatl. That's obviously a very human situation. And if you look at the teeth and the mouth and... Uh, the representative of the plumed winged jewel serpent behind him. This is obviously you're starting an ascent into the underworld, not Hades, but you're starting an ascent out of your life to be reborn again. Okay. Let's go to the next one. And this is just uh, another close up of that, of showing that when all the red paint was taken off, and you can see the. Uh, sacred jaguar and the face of the initiate inside and you're looking for rebirth and this is sort of like an investiture and admission to their enthronement in a new world like trying to get admitted you're trying to for an introduction to a new life you know this is what this is all about right let's go to the next slide and then we have the stella showing the rabbit told you at the top you see him the very top up there on the extreme right yeah. yeah and now the initiates feet are 
uh, ascending, and the Nishas has found the authority that they wanted. They were reclined on the ceremonial mat at the top below the rabbit, and the initiate has gained the wisdom they sought from the ceremony, and now they have ascending feet. Mm. And it's shown again, the rabbit, with Exotal, which is a god of death in the underworld, and a brother of Quetzalcoatl is sort of his bad double, and he's now headless and clawed. Your ego is dead, and it's headless and clawed, and you're going to the underworld, and you banished uh, this god. And now it's your duty to take this heavenly fire and lighting and protect the world above. You're waking to a new spiritual life and well-being. And this is the final transition of, ma of matter into spiritual rebirth and energy. You know, uh, this bad god was a son of Kulakik and a, and a dark personification of Venus. And everything of the, like this is an idea that you're trying to balance everything now. And there's no concept of good and evil or a devil and a god. It's just gaining a life in balance and realizing that life is a, either pain or uh, love. And all this keeps things going. We're going to experience all of this as long as we live. Now go to the next slide. Here again we see the sacred feathers and the Quetzal above the uh, feminine representing, and you see the urns, and at the very top, the female Quetzal feathers representing the female disembodied eye. And there again, we see the initiate in the center there. That's you, Mike. Hmm. <laughs> or Morris, Maurice. And then down below, you see I'm the ready. sacred mats and the ceremonial and the things, the Kunexes, and they represent the heart and the drops of blood that represent the heart. These are what these symbols are, that you're putting your heart on line in this sacred sacrifice in the temple. Interesting. Let's go to the next one. Oh, this is a side view where you're seeing the jaguar and the sacred arrow through the corn, which is very important because not only did Quetzalcoatl find the sacred mushrooms that created all this artistic, the, the uh, sacred connections with the deity, but he also brought coin. So they, they could, you know, you're not going to be build cities, great cities, if you're always a hunter gatherer. Right. Let's go to the next, next slide. One. Yeah, this is just another close up showing the four drops of blood. I can never get too much of looking at these, you know, uh, and, and contemplating them. Go ahead to the next one. Okay. Okay. Now, this is uh, the third cell of Xochimilco. This represents Quetzalcoatl's trusted friend, and he's wearing uh, – the sacred ceremonies that above and the rivers of life are flowing below, but you can see him in the center. Quetzalcoatl has turned himself into Talak. And you have those Google eyes there and the flowers of the blood, which represent the uh, uh, sacred mushrooms and this Stella. And this is how it was found when it's still painted red and it just been broken up. Let's go to the next one. Now, we're looking at this now where uh, this is the sacred flowers on the tongue. And that represents a soul as it joins and binds the initiate to Quetzalcoatl. And you see coming out of the mouth on the two sides of mushrooms, but the way you're eating it there is buccally without swallowing. And the sacred mushrooms go directly to the spine and the brain. And you said that, that that actually makes it more potent, right? Like it takes a lot longer to for the onset, but when it does come on... It's... Oh, it's much faster for the onset. Oh, it is faster? Unbelievably faster than the stuff. <laughs> okay. I mean, that's why when you take an aspirin or some medicine and you want to get it in the body fast, you don't swallow it. The stomach, you hold it in your mouth and just keep it there. 
and don't swallow, but then you have buccal or it's called subliminal administration where it'll go into the bloodstream and it's way, way faster. Okay. That's why I think we mentioned the other day when we were talking about salvia divinorum and somebody was taking it where they're drinking it and going to the gut. Yeah, that was... uh... working, But when they started sucking on it and sucking it in, then it went much faster to their... uh, and it actually worked for them. Well, that's what I was. That's what I meant when I what I just said is that if you were to just swallow the mushrooms, would it not take longer for them to come on? Yeah. Yeah. That w- it, oh, I thought. Yeah, I that's what I was saying. But I but you're right. We did we did talk about salvia uh, salvia di- uh, divinorum the other day because I was talking about on the episode of uh, Hamilton's Pharmacopoeia where he went down and did the rituals and the lady gave him uh, initially a mashed up. Um, uh, drink, you know, she used the por- uh, m- uh, mortar and pestle and he drank it and it didn't really do anything. But then the next day she made him like suck and chew on the leaves and it had an amazing effect. He said it's one of his favorite trips of all time, I think. Well, this is, this is the amazing difference. And it sort of, you know, a lot of people, and I've eaten peyote a lot and I can eat it slowly and take it and have no problem. And ayahuasca to me is very easy to take. But sometimes when people even take the mushrooms, they think it smells bad or it's going to taste bad or something like that. So they're in a hurry to get it in some sort of tea and drink it, you know, and get it down there really fast or they try to eat really fast. Yeah, so I, think, they don't, don't. I think tea's a waste. I've never, I've had a couple of good tea experiences, but for the most part, it's, it seems like it's just wasting the, uh, well, if you put a lot of honey in tea, especially with dried mushrooms, you put a lot of honey and raw fruit juice, and it and the mushrooms are going to ground up really good, it will work, but nothing works compared uh, to the mastication. Right. No, I agree with that. Now, every time when I do do it, I chew and suck on them for as long as I can until they start to dissipate and then you know eventually i'll swallow that but well this is why i'm trying to relate to this people uh, sacred ceremony of the deified heart because i find all sorts of people pontificating on the mushroom and you never hear anybody talking about this and you know for i started my book in 73 and i didn't finish to 2019 and i'd start think i would hear somebody say this or talk about this a lot because I'm not the only one that knows about it by any means. There's lots of people that know about this and know about this tech and do it. And some of them didn't have to have somebody else teach them down in Mexico. They just figured it out for the center it was, you know, to slowly masticate and right. with honey. And then you're taking pure glucose and taking it directly in your body. Honey's the purest food in the world that it doesn't even have to be digested. You put honey on your arm. And, and it will go in, you know, it's, uh, absolutely will turn into pure glucose. And with your saliva, you're changing all this to a pure glucose injection with all the psilocin changed, uh, uh, psilocybin changed to psilocin. It's going directly into the bloodstream. If that's what you're trying to get, because psilocybin in the stomach, it has to get into the bloodstream and then it has to start going through the body. Right. And there's even points where, where some people, they'll even start to nod off and go to sleep. And then it's like they're awake. Yeah. And they're awake. The, the most amazing thing is you start to see how your body feels and glows. That's why I think it's so horrible with these masks because, especially in the daylight, when you take this and you have a problem or issue you're dealing with and you're thinking about and you got your subconscious mind now it's what's called the level of awareness. There's three levels of, I mean, of the conscious mind. It's at its third level. It's past absorption. It's past attention. It's into a super, super level of awareness, especially the level of awareness, almost like an animal where time is stopped. And there is a time, almost like an athlete, but far more than that, that's playing. That's what they call in the zone. You know, like you played when you were a little kid, you know, right. and time did you were in this theta state. You like a flow just, state kind of a thing. Exactly. And then you have the unconscious mind come on. And all of a sudden, 
you have the body, which is intelligent and living and related to the heart. And that's why the ceremony is a deified heart. And you're finding out about things in your body that you can exercise or get rid of that are usually caused by how you're thinking. And I tell people, you know, when you were born and came into this world, you didn't have any of these thoughts or anything. And for the first seven years, a child is not like an adult. Their brain in like a little sponge that gets bigger. It's in this theta state. And it, and, and it later changes to these other brainwave states. That's why children can learn music and art so much. And Well, that's what they just did. See a... these invisible friends, you know? See, see these uh, invisible friends. And, and they just did you're... a study, though. Uh, sorry to cut you off, but they did a study where um, they found that children, um, because of what you're talking about, are more creative than, like, the most creative we are is almost when we are young or kids till like you said, like five, six, seven years old. And then we start to develop these different um, brain. And I think a lot of that has to do with language too. The more you master. Well, it's, it's like with the Piaget did all these studies and the only school that really does this. And I'm talking about the only one is like the Steiner Walder school because they believe in creative play and they believe in teaching the kids language and music. And it's so easy. I mean, you know, you go to South America and you see two adults and at the end of a month, maybe they can order a beer and find out where the bathroom is. <laughs> in three or four weeks of a kid playing, he's already talking to the kids in the village and knows the language. Right. You know, so at certain times, you have the ability to learn things way, way better. That's why when people, you know, are musicians or stuff, they try to get them playing early. And, and it's that creative play. And you don't want that right brain stuff till later. But adults are scared to death that if their students don't, learn to read and write. And that's why it's important for kids to have little gardens and make little gardens and, and to have toys that are, don't look like Barbies and all this finished things that are like rag dolls and make their own toys and to learn how to work goes. together, you know, and uh, to sing and play little musical instruments, even if it's like just a little recorder. And then, and then kids start to realize, well, maybe this kid's good at this singing, but he's good at this and everybody has something. And so they all value, start to value what they are, you know, and a language especially is just unbelievable how fast children could get it. I, I know my son, when I was working in the solar industry and my wife was working, we had a friend, a, a, a Guatemalan woman, and she took care of him a lot. And she talked to him all the time in Spanish, and he's always been fluent in Spanish. He's fluent in Portuguese now, and he's down in Portuguese. But he was just totally always fluent in Spanish, and it came easy to him because she would talk to him all day long in uh, her language. No, I mean, that that makes sense, and you bring up some good points for sure. I mean, I definitely agree with all that, and, you know, um, that's why, you know, we always look back on our childhood to, like you said, talking with imaginary friends or creating games and just – it's almost like – when you're, you know, on a mushroom trip or psilocybin or whatever, you you revert back. It's almost like that um, restriction that you have placed on yourself or within your consciousness is is lifted up again, and you you have all the creativity and thoughts in the world. You know, that's at least how I feel. I feel like it brings you back to that place a little bit. Well, you have to open yourself to where it takes you. Now, it's like I said before. Sometimes, you know, I think I'm gonna go on a biahe. Or, or something like that, and all of a sudden, you know, I'm a uh, something totally different. But you have to learn, understand that that's for you. But a lot of times, you're seeing simple things in character development where it's showing you forks in the road. And there's been great examples of people being healed, but they were told, "Well, you got to change your life. You got to change thinking, or you got to ch change how this is happening in a certain way." Right. Let's go to the next one now. Well, this is just a picture I don't have quite right of chocolate being poured in preparation for the ceremony, like when it's taken before this ceremony to uh, get people ready in a blissful state for the yeah, well, ceremony instead yeah, of being well, anxious. You were talking about that earlier with uh, cacao and, um, you know, I guess the closest people can, you know, you can still get cacao and stuff, but if you were going to, most people... I think that's the allure of dark chocolate is, I mean, I actually like the taste of dark chocolate, but it also yeah, there's an endorphin blast. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. But the thing of it is, you can get the real beans online. 
Right. And when you dark chocolate is better, but the difference is all the difference is there's less milk. Right. In dark chocolate, but it's still gone through the Dutch process where they've heated it up and compressed it and put some alkaloids in it. And there's nowhere near the benefits of when you get the raw beans. A lot of people will put them in smoothies or just make a drink out of it. But the theobromine is it is incredible. And it's also really uh, unbelievably high in antioxidants. Yeah. And I know on the West Coast now, it's sort of, there's sort of a fad of after yoga, all these people doing hmm. cacao and having cacao ceremonies to feel good. And That sounds about like, right. Beans are cheap online. It, they're not expensive. Yeah, definitely. You you, you pulled up the uh, coffee beans earlier too. People should definitely check that out if they're interested. Yeah, I pulled those were cacao beans, and you can easily order them online. And you want to get ones that are unshelled or or you know just get the, get the raw beans. And you keep them in a freezer because when you do put them in a coffee grinder, you, you want them to not heat up. You know, that's why you want to be cold as you're grinding them. And then you just boil hot water. And when the it starts boiling, you cut it off and you wait for the water to quit boiling. And mm. when it quits boiling, that's when you pour it in there. And then later you might pull it through a strainer because it'll be just a little bit oily. I have made it in, in like a coffee pot before, but then... I like it just as it is. A lot of people will put a couple of drops of vanilla in it or they'll put honey in it or mm. some people will put a teeny bit of cocoa butter in it just to make it taste better. But I think it's wonderful. Sure. Let's go to the next one now. This is just a close-up, again, of Talak, where Quetzalcoatl has transformed himself into Talak. You'll see the sacred mushroom on the left and right, the self-sacrifice above and the symbol of the temple where it took place. And then you see what are called the flowers of the blood on the tongue. Mm -hmm. These were the ongo sagrados, meaning sacred mushrooms. And the flowers of the tongue were an example of how they were to be taken and taken into the heart to create the fire and the blood for healing. And as we know now, this is... Uh, regrowing brain cells for dementia. It's I have all sorts of effects on Alzheimer's and dementia. In certain places, when I go to talk now, I'm amazed at the elderly women that show up and want to know about this. And now it's easy to get spores through the mail in different places and, you know, to grow your own or find it in a field or somewhere. I was going to ask you about, too, has there any been, and I, I've seen some things, but do you know of any connection to these things helping, you know, people with like neuropathy, whether it be from diabetes or, you know, cancer treatments or whatever. Well, it I sort of helps the body heal itself by, by creating a type of uh, oxygen flow that helps the body he heal itself. Uh, I met one gentleman that I mentioned before that had been going to see six doctors and had a real problem, couldn't get rid of his violent cluster headaches. Mm -hmm. And so finally, he does like a lot of people, he started reading on the internet, and he found out that this would do it, and he lived in Mississippi or Louisiana, I can't remember which, but he just went out in the cow fields and got them. He said, first time, it totally eliminated his cluster headaches, uh, and that he also mentioned, I asked him, you still do it? And he says, yeah, I'd still do it for spiritual purposes, but I want to don't want to talk about that, it's just my own thing. And I said, I understand that. I've also heard of a lot of use where it's eliminated allergies, mm. uh, like somebody allergic to a cat or somebody, Weird. and it totally limits it's that allergy. Or even if the allergy came back, they knew it was possible not to have it. Yeah. I think I heard who was talking about that. Oh, you know, it was, um, I think it was Dr. Andrew wheel who was on Joe Rogan, uh, last year. And he was talking about how, you know, I think he was talking about LSD, though, about how psychedelics helped uh, some allergies and some weird study. But, um, yeah, that's it's definitely weird to think well, about. There, that. there was a, there was an incredible study where he was at where this was 78 and Hoffman and Wasson and Schultes was there. And I was there and they had this government like MK Ultra and they had given this sacred mushroom to like this woman that was dying and four doctors, and I guess she was part of a program, she was dying, and 
the most amazing thing they said is when she took them, she had a baby and the, it was her report. What she reported to them was she got in touch with the baby and the baby said, I want to live. This isn't going to work if you die a couple of months from now. So you need to get heal yourself and everything. And uh, she had an epiphany and she healed her whole body and the uh, baby was born. Wow. And I thought it was maybe a telepathy, but they actually show now that there's brain cells, the baby and the mother are sharing. Mm -hmm. And so this is a spiritual relationship uh, between the mother and that baby. But a lot of times these healing things, it's like it's giving you a choice without, you know, like a Christian or some religions, this is good or this is bad. This is a sin or this isn't. It's just it's providing you information. Right. If you want to get your life in balance, maybe you need to quit smoking cigarettes or you need to quit having these think thoughts. You know, it's having a, a tremendous effect on people in hospice. They're allowing people in Australia to take it now that are dying. And lots of experiments in hospices where it's made people not fear death anymore, but it's also had a great effect on people that had a cancer operation or something, they're always in agony and anxiety that it's coming back. And I remember reading one of the reports, this woman said when she was there, it's like she saw this thing in her body that she was hosting that was causing all this, and she started screaming and yelling for it to get out. And I've seen this in a lot of ceremonies with people the first time where they sometimes puke up or vomit or poop out the most incredible things. They get rid of things that are in their body or it's just like a tension or energy that's released that they've been holding there inside of their body. And their mm -hmm. body has made the connection with the conscious and unconscious. And that's why I believe two reasons this is going to become legal is one is the elite oligarchies think they can live forever. So they want these brain cells and want this healing. But also this is the only thing that's been proven to have a great success rate in cu cooling, uh, cu curing opioid addictions and other Lotus type addictions. If you go to a website called reset.me, R-E-S-E-T dot M-E, you can see all this where it's uh, everything uh, from curing all sorts of things of uh, spousal abuse and addictions, but especially with the opioids because what happens is the conscious mind is like a little teeny place, like imagine a small city, and underneath it, like the iceberg below, is this huge monster area of the unconscious. Mm -hmm. And the body is the other part, and a lot of times I've known a friend of mine or somebody who supposedly, and supposedly got off heroin or got off fentanyl or whatever, and they're at a party and somebody gives them Xanax or they take a little bit too much to drink or something like that. Next thing they know, they've lost their resistance. The conscious mind is now on guard and the body's calling for it without it being living and intelligent. But what happens is when the body is living and intelligent and can instruct the conscious and unconscious mind, you can all work together, what I call the sacred pyramid, to get rid of these addictions and stuff because then you start to become aware of what it's really doing and what the conscious is instead of this just hunger to satisfy sort of this existential sort of thing like uh, anxiety and depression right. over the world today. And I can see why if you look at the suicide rates and all that that's going up and, you know, these opioid addictions – when I hiked the Appalachian Trail for six months in 2016, I'd come into some little small town every 10th day or two weeks to resupply with food, and I'd have to wash my clothes to get the smell out. And, you know, I'd be reading a little newspaper in there, and there's five people in a parking lot, locals, that died on fentanyl somewhere. So yeah. it affects all cultures and all races. And if you look how it's been increasing – uh, I think in 2016, it killed more people in the Vietnam War. And it was like 60,000 then. And it's been increasing at about 15,000, 16,000 a year. Yeah, it's sad. I mean, well, we've, they, we've definitely have known some people definitely affected by this. You know, we've lost a couple friends. and uh, I think in 2016. 
Yeah. Or maybe it was 17. Oh, regardless, it's a lot, man. It's a yeah. Well, you know, a, a lot of people would like to say, oh, this is uh, all childhood trauma and everything. Hell no. Not for every situation, because I know people, fine upstanding people in the community, doctors and lawyers, and both of my sons were athletes and got hurt. And they always give them a 30-day supply. And I remember one friend one time, he was his sixth day and there was no more pain. And that morning he couldn't wait to take it. And he was there getting ready to take one. He totally freaked out and just threw it all in the toilet and flushed it. Mm-hmm. But I had to send one of my sons up to Tennessee uh, to help get off of it. And I had another son that finally got off of it by going to a remote area. But I know uh, that's why they're trying for like athletics, like the NFL and different leagues are at least entertaining the idea of, um, you know, marijuana instead of giving people these opioid prescriptions. Cause you got to imagine a lot of those guys are just in pain all the time, you know? Well, there's oh, yeah. a lot of pain, but I think if they ever start taking, uh, the psilocybin and stuff, you want to amaze the difference of athletes. Like I, I've heard stories and I've seen situations of people that couldn't even walk barefooted like dance and just enjoy dancing on rocks. And uh, it, if you read Hoffman's book and Schulte's book and the physiology, it talks about how it makes a patella-like reflex. It makes people able to move like a panther. Mm. It's a type of reflex that normally your signal is going from exterior through your spine to your brain and back to your spine to act. But it causes the reflex to go to your spine and directly from your spine, you're bypassing the brain. And I've seen people run along the top of a fence, just incredible, like a squirrel on this stuff. Amazing things. I know people, yeah. some of the programs online, uh, some guys from England talking about how they use it in UMA fights. You know, they're microdosing and they say it just makes them unbelievably quicker, but not only unbelievably quicker, but able to read the body language of the other person and what they're about to do before they do it. Yeah. Joe Rogan talks about that on his podcast. Like when he does jujitsu, how, you know, a lot of these fighters are micro dosing psilocybin and they can, yeah, like you said, they can predict other people's movements. They have, they feel better generally uh, on a day-to-day basis. Yeah. They um, probably recover quicker. Yeah. Well, and they're also uh, moving much faster because their reflexes are, you know, that patella-like reflex is a cat-like when something taps you on the knee, you know? Right. But you're moving without thinking about your actions. It's like an athlete to be a great athlete. If you're thinking about what you're doing, boy, you're in trouble. <laughs> you have to just be processing what you're doing. Right, you got to be in and, that flow and, state. And you're really speed, and plus your eyesight. Uh, sometimes on uh, the sacred mushroom, it's like your eyesight can see much wider, much more in depth. On the corner of your eye, you have something called the nicotining membrane. Now, most humans don't know that they have it right there on the corner. Uh, Lizards have it. Dogs and cats have it to keep dust and stuff out. But the nicotining membrane pulls back when you're on the sacred mushroom. Sure. And your pupils also open wider. And you're able to see sort of like eagle-like or stereoscopically. That's why I call this one chapter the gift of the eagle and jaguar because you're able to see incredibly better. And I know a lot of opticians and pharmacists are looking into this because it seems to relieve the pressure on the eye. Mm. But it's like you form a much greater depth of field and you it's sort of like you can go stereoscopic back and forth. I mean, I'm sure, Mike, when you took the sacred mushroom, you looked like something like a little ant or something, and it looked like it was Godzilla, right? When you yeah. looked up it up close. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely take your vision down like that. Right, right. No, you're right. There's you definitely have those weird, like, depth of vision issues where things look giant or things look small. Like you definitely get that effect for sure. And then the intuition things happen. It's like I tell people, I say when this intuition happens. Don't pay attention to it. It's just a tool. It's just like all of a sudden you're walking down the road and you find yourself on a bicycle. Just accept you're on it and go because, and don't look at the bicycle or you'll run into something. I mean, mm-hmm. we're talking about a situation where our ancient ancestors had things like clairvoyance. They had a type of, had to feel their senses and feel what was around them and intuition. 
and uh, almost like a type of ESP. And that's because they didn't have all this stuff. You're out in the wilderness like that. You got to tune yourself into all of that. You got to have a feeling. I, I was out in the wilderness one time and it was like I was sleeping. All of a sudden I felt something coming and I, I knew it was something coming. And I felt, and I looked up and it was a big bear coming up on the trail behind me. Oh, geez. Coming over. Well, it's just a black bear. And I laughed at it and I said, hey, <laughs> boo boo. Uh, no, hey, Yogi, where's boo boo? And he was sort of upset because he had to go the other way, you know? <laughs> I don't worry yeah. about black bears. I've been around them all my life. I, I had one come into a shelter one time when it was raining it's called Billy Bears at the end of the Appalachian Trail. I told him, you better get out. The ranger check catches you in there, and he's going to tag you and take you way out. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I think the only ones you really have to worry about are the uh, grizzlies because the they get that taste for human flesh. Well, the and thing I felt clench people, it. I've been out at Yellowstone and never went – the grizzlies in, in the winter looking for wolves and, and mountain lions. And uh, most of the people out there take bear spray, uh, like the pepper spray, because even hunters realize uh, if you can't get to your rifle, it's, you're not going to get time to get a big pistol and aim and be cool. And you have to have a large caliber. But if you spray yourself with a cloud of, you know, if you release this pepper spray, the bear is going to go away. In fact, there's some camping suits now that have a rip cord on them to pull them and you put yourself in a cloud of pepper spray. Oh, that's cool. I didn't hear that before. Oh, yeah, it's a way to oh, take burns, on grizzlies because they don't want to go through all death. this. Very few people could be calm enough if they see a grizzly to yell at him or scare him or no right. tell him what he would do. You know, uh, a lot of the 10 most hiking trail, dangerous hiking trails in the world that are on my bucket list. One of them is just because you have to go through where so many Kodak bears are. Mm. And you might become lunch. <laughs> All right, let's get back here. So we had this one. Let's go to now, the final. One more, I think. Yeah, final. This is the. Oh, yeah, this is the picture of Maria Sabina. Now, I wanted to ask you before when we were going over all the codices, was Maria Sabina, did she. You know, was she aware of the codices and did she study from them or was it just she was taught no, by some? No, no, no. Uh, she was a natural Sabio Curandera. Okay. See, the ancient cities where the priests were and the uh, say the big shots mm -hmm. and the pre they were wiped out by the Spanish and killed. But a lot of people knew about these traditions, and they lived in these very remote areas. And, you know, when Watson first got his message about Walla, which very few people had been to, you know, no electricity, no uh, refrigeration, no paved roads. You know, the missionary said, well, where these sacred mushrooms grew, they said, fell from the blood of Christ. They take they transferred Christ into... Uh, Quetzalcoatl and that they took them because they had no doctors and they didn't have any medical clinics and they would take them into altars in the home or altars on the Catholic Church because they worked. They were for medicine and healing. Right. Well, they're sort of like in this ray of this, there's curanderos and curanderos with or men who are chosen by the mushroom. You cannot choose to be a curandero or curandera. It allows you to choose that path in your life if you want to. It's the plant and the affinity with you. But Maria Sabina was way beyond that. She was considered to have the book of creation open to her. When she was a child, she had participated in ceremonies, but her and her sister's job were to guard the chickens with the day. They would walk out as little girls with sticks to keep the hawks from eating the chickens. See, Walt was so high, it's called the eagle's nest. It's very up there in the clouds. And when she was out there with her sister, she would eat the mushrooms. Mm. And she became known really as a famous curandero. And that's gone down through her family. Uh, I've seen a great, great granddaughter that uh, I think now is going to be a curandero. And this may pass down through families or certain people, but she was basically the reason she was considered so good was because not only was she a midwife, but all her relatives and friends and her family, she was able to keep alive and everything. And remember, these people didn't have any refrigeration, no refrigeration trucks. Uh, people that talked about this time before this era is like going back in Neanderthal times. Right. 
you know, is very, very primitive. A lot of people still use donkeys. There was no plastic. And she spoke Maztec. And I know in the ceremony that I did with her, maybe we can have a talk sometime about the ceremony where I was at her house and met her. You know, oh, nice. it's like she was just totally a part of the earth. She yeah. was absolutely, it looked like her, her bare feet grew out of the earth. Hmm. And now did she, did, uh, so she was considered somewhat of like, I mean, you, you brought up Rudolf Steiner earlier and he talked a lot about like initiates. These are people that have this connection to whatever metaphysical thing you want to call it. But um, it seems like you either have it or you don't, you could probably learn, you know, but most people, it's almost like a, like you said, something that's passed down or something. Well, I really believe with the sacred effigies, that's why I laugh and say how hysterically funny it is that you're going to take a weekend seminar or a seminar online to be a shaman or you're going to take a tourist trip because usually these sort of things open themselves up to people and make them available and they can reject it or not. There's this one famous story in Walt about this guy who had seen six re regular Western doctors and told he was going to die, and he went to Waltla, and he took the sacred mushroom, and he was told that he could live, but he had to be a curandero, and he didn't want to say, I don't want to be a curandero, hmm. and the sacred mushroom was like, well, we don't have any stake in this. It's just, this is it. If you be a curandero, you die. It doesn't make any difference that death, life and death are the same side of the same coin. Right. And so he became a curandero. But what I'm trying to say, there's traditions of people that come out of this, but most of the people that are really what I consider genuine are super humble because they realize the plant does this. Right. And if you claim any of this for yourself, you're like really in trouble. Like I don't, the people that are real shamans or not shamans, but curanderos or have an affinity with the plants don't like to call themselves anything. They don't like to label themselves because uh, this is a plant that you that teaches you yourself. Like the curandero or the wise person or whatever may help you get there or take it in a way that will help you get there, but you got to row the boat. This isn't a cruise ship where you're going on a cruise and everything's going to be served up to you. You have to personally want to make the changes in your life and have this and you're out there in this boat rowing, you know, and right. this corn get barrel out and the in. sacred mushroom will take you to the place. But it's really laughable that, that somebody thinks they're going to take a course <laughs> to be a shaman or curandero. Not that the sacred mushrooms and these plants can't help everybody and benefit right. everybody. Well, That's isn't that true. what we were we talking about? To... We were talking about that earlier. Cause you were talking about like in the clinical, you know, setting how they're, um, they're using it now in, uh, you know, psychiatric, uh, psychiatrics and psychology and helping people with depression and PTSD and addiction and all these things. Isn't that more of like, um, that's like the way our Western world works. So you have like, you know, this tradition and everything from, you know, the Aztecs and the Mayans and all of this stuff. And it seems like the updated version or, you know, 2.0, 3.0 or whatever is this clinical setting. Well, that, that'll that be that way. And that's why I disagree with this. And I know in Florida, they have ayahuasca religions. I think this is so bizarre because people were using the sacred mushroom as far back in time as ayahuasca. And yeah, but my point is this, I, is that isn't it so isn't it more respectful to do it in the clinical way nowadays as opposed to like half-assing the ancient ways or the ancient rituals because then well, that see that's where i disagree okay because the way i look at it these ancient ways these ancient rituals get you in touch with a parallel world and people that exist out there and enable you to communicate with the plants right and you make the connection between nature and what's outside there and there's all spirits in these people and this is a different parallel world in the what i call the tree of life uh there was this guy, I think his name was Tony Shearer, that wrote an incredible book called The Lord of the Dawn, which is a poetic book about Quetzalcoatl, and I believe in these sacred things. Now, I'm not saying the other way, pharmacologically, can't help people and won't help people. But if you read Pollen's book, and if you look at a lot of these people and what they're doing in these places, 
Jesus. It has nothing to do with the sacrament. It's just another pill. Right. But what I'm saying you is, know, isn't that better than these fake people misinterpreting, you know, the ancient ways? Meaning that there's you have this, you have the real uh, curanderos, curanderas, shamans. You know, those people that are that's their indigenous culture. They understand it. They're they're that's their lives. And then you have these like Western people coming down and trying to take up you know their version of it i'm saying isn't the clinical version better because in that way you're not disrespecting the ancient cultures like some of these pretenders if you will you know you do you get what i'm saying yeah it's almost like there's two different worlds you've right. got the one world that's controlled by the academic pharmaceutical and that's almost like horses with a binder and you have to go down a certain road because even if you're a person that does experiments like at John Hopkins and they have these, the rabbi and the Buddhist and the Catholic and take it its most religious experience. And I'm sure if some of these people went out and saw in the wilderness, uh, some of these, uh, sacred beings, uh, they might privately tell somebody, but they would never in a group do that or admit to that because you're dealing with the academic license and, uh, mm -hmm what people would consider whether you could practice or, you know, cause that's all controlled by what I call the oligarchy and the media of, uh, of the narrative by academia and the psychiatrist. And some sure. of these people are some of the most wacky people in the world. And I hear about them talking about the di different and diversities and stuff and what they're going to do. And I could tell they really don't have a concept about the spiritual. On the other hand, it's not so bad with the mushroom because the mushroom will sort of whack you hard if you're like that. If you come around the second time or do it, if you're doing this sort of stuff, it's going to mirror it to you. You're going to have right. a real hard time. And I don't think it's as bad with ayahuasca because, I mean, people that are nuts enough to think they're a shaman after a few trips or going <laughs> on a tourist trip. But to me, ayahuasca is sort of like going on a canoe trip and you're going down and you're, you're seeing the jungle present different images to you and, and different things in your psyche, and, it, and that's really great. Uh, but some of this stuff, like with this bufo frog, 5-MeO-DNT, I'm sorry, no matter what these fanboys and fangirls say, and we talked about this on your... Uh, yeah, we did an episode uh, for our Patreon account. People and that's, that's what some of these people edition. are doing. You know, like on my website, it shows this person that's pouring water down the throat of somebody. Well, my God, the first thing in first aid, you know, is you don't drown somebody that's having a problem. Right. You know, you uh, the last thing you do is pour something down their throat. You, you know, if you've got water, you might pour it on their head to cool them off, or you might put their body in a bath. Or you might uh, put them in a shower, but it's just crazy. You're like when you're advertising for money and you're doing this stuff and people have no idea of what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry, fanboys of uh, Bufo Frog and everything. I'm not dissing this plant. I'm not saying anything bad about the toad venom of what's going to happen, but there is no ancient traditional tradition this, right and you could check was every mention of this was in 1971 yeah you can check that out too we talk about the origins of it and where we think the first um you know examples are of people using it and understanding it and stuff but let's um let's wrap it up there we've almost done two hours and 45 minutes it's super long it's probably one of our longest episodes um but i appreciate you coming on and this is super enlightening i thought this time around, I think we got the audio right, and uh, I think you conveyed the uh, codices a lot better. Uh, it seems like we did an all-around uh, better job this time. So, but uh, right. Well, I hope this helps a lot of people. Yeah. So people can sure. uh, check out your book. It's uh, Sacred Mushroom Rituals: uh, The Quest and Search for the Blood of Quetzalcoatl. Uh, the link is down below the video. You can check out his book. Also, what's the name of your Facebook group that you have? It's just uh, Sacred Mushroom Rituals. I'm sorry, Sacred Mushroom Ceremonies and Rituals. Sacred Ceremony, Sacred Mushroom ri Ceremonies and Rituals. Sacred Mushroom Ceremonies and Rituals. And the basic thing, we study the antiquity like this and we study the mushrooms, but there's no politics, there's no social issues, 
it's just about spreading the knowledge about plants and everything and uh, looking at the benefits of how it can help humanity and studying ayahuasca too and peyote and San Pedro and even certain types of cannabis that was used like in the Tibetan temple balls and other ways of using that. Mm -hmm. And of course the sacred mushroom and everybody's invited to contribute and bring something there and always have the attitude of like, well, if you're saying something, it's my opinion or right. I believe this. Don't, don't get into this thing of calling people names. <laughs> yeah. Because. Well, that's good because you know, that's no trolling allowed. Yeah, well, that's all our culture is now. I think that's what we've tried to cult cultivate with this podcast, too, is just put good information out there and let people decide for themselves as opposed to proclaiming, you know, superiority of knowledge or any of that kind of stuff. It's at the end of the day, um, you know, the human mind is a funny thing and there's cognitive bias, confirmation bias. And like I said, we're just putting, trying to put out good information, let people decide for themselves and have intelligent dialogues and conversations about it. And I've seen that on your uh, Facebook group as well. So that's good. That's what it should be. Uh, but yeah, check out, uh, check out his Facebook group, check out his book. Um, and uh, we'll have you on again. Maybe like I said, ne next time, maybe we can just talk about Maria Sabina and your, your experiences with her. Um, and, uh, yeah, subscribe to our channel. Uh, like I said, we have that extra video, um, with Tom talking about five MEO DMT on our Patreon account. Uh, you get that for just $2 a month along with some other stuff and, uh, check out our website. We're also on Instagram, the links right there, uh, Twitter and, uh, Facebook, but, uh, thanks again, Tom. And thanks for again, for redoing this. I know we got the audio wrong last time, but I think well, we got it. It was a blessing that we got it wrong because, <laughs> I should have read more about the Stellas of Xochimilco. I, all the images of uh, that one codex, I, I know pretty well, but the Stellas of Xochimilco, I'm really trying, you know, there's so much of that hard to understand that imagery in stone unless you read it again because it's not quite as obvious. And if there's somebody in Mexico City, I'll pay for them to go to the museum and get me some pictures from the third one of Talak because I, I don't have any good pictures of the side or back of that one. Okay. I can I'll, end up flying down there myself. I'll search too and see if I can maybe find something on Adobe stock or something. Sometimes they have cool stuff from museums on there. They might have it, but I'll, I'll, I'll give that a, a check for you. But yeah, thanks for coming on and uh, we'll have thank you on you again sir. in the future. And thank you for your time. Bye. See ya. Cheers. Bye.